Yeah, I went too far at first. I was like, wait a minute. That's a good thing to say. Yeah. Yeah. I mostly stole it from Mark Anthony. Oh, so. Good. <laughs> Hey, Patrick. How are you? I think I'm okay. Good. Margarita meetings. Yeah, or two or three. Thank you. Some of them. Cool. Okay. Yeah, I totally spaced it. chalk, thank you. Okay, here goes Good evening. I'd like to call the Durham City Council meeting to order for Monday, December the 4th, 2017. Times two, December the 18th uh, at 7 o'clock p.m. And we certainly want to welcome all of you all in attendance. We're glad you're here tonight. Could we now please take a moment for silent meditation? Thank you. I'm now going to recognize Council Member Charlie Reese, who's going to... Uh, lead us in the Pledge of the Flag or help others lead us in the Pledge of the Flag. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's a privilege to sit in this seat and have this responsibility that was so ably performed. In the last council bar, former colleague, Eddie Davis. Uh, tonight, we're joined by Troop 451 for Boy Scouts. If they'll come on up. As they do come up, I will, um, they are going to lead the pledge for us this evening. <clears throat> oh, that's a lot of Boy Scouts. That's awesome. <laughs> Twice as many as there were earlier. That's so great. <laughs> um, and they're going to bring the mic. If you guys want to walk all the way around here, <laughs> and uh, folks here in the audience, um, if you're able to do so, and if you, it is your custom to do so, please rise and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I'm custom to kneel. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Troop 451. Appreciate it, guys. Excellent job, Scouts. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Reese. And I would ask the City Clerk to please call the roll. Mayor Shule. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Here. Council Member Alston. Here. Council Member Freeman. Here. Council Member Middleton. Here. Council Member and Council Member Reese. Here. We have two ceremonial items tonight. Both of them we're very glad to have on our agenda. And the first is the neighborhood spotlight. And could I ask Janine Wardrick and members of her family and friends that she would like to have come with her, please come on up. Can you make it up the stairs? Okay, great.
tonight we're presenting one of our neighborhood spotlights, and I'm very excited for this. Janine Wardrick is the recipient of the Neighbor Spotlight for the month of December 2017. The Neighbor Spotlight Award recognizes community members that have gone above and beyond in volunteering their time to serve the community. This month, Janine Wardrick, a resident of Ridgefield neighborhood, was nominated and selected because of the wonderful work she has done in her neighborhood. She's helping to coordinate and implement the Health E-Community Project by soliciting the support of other residents and conducting outreach for participation, sharing encouraging and informative information to help residents reach health goals, assisting in the preparation of the Neighborhood Improvement Service Neighborhood Matching Grants application, working with neighbors to paint the Healthy Mile Trail and inaugurating its use with the Girl Trek team. Congratulations, Mrs. Wardrick on being the December Neighbor Spotlight for the City of Durham, and thank you for all the work you do to improve the Durham community. Uh, and I will now uh, ask if, if you would like to come forward, but before I do, are there any other residents that, would, that are here that you would like to uh, st have stand up in your support, or is this your group? Uh, this is our group. I like to have Debbie stand. Okay. Taking pictures. Great. Come on up. This is a good time to take pictures. And I will also be presenting this neighborhood Neighbor Spotlight Award. This certificate is awarded Janine Wardrick in recognition of valuable contribution to the Ridgefield neighborhood. And then it, it lists those wonderful things that she has been doing. It's signed by Tom Bonfield, our city manager, and by myself. And uh, we're pleased to present this to you, Ms. Wardrick, and I hope you might have a few words to say to us. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. I'd just like to say that uh, this is an honor. Um, it's been great working with Healthy Community in Ridgefield Subdivision and where we're trying to help everyone live a more healthier life. And uh, just thank you very much. All right, now we're going to have a Human Rights Day and Bill of Rights Day proclamation. I'm going to ask Joan Walsh to come forward from the Durham Bill of Rights Defense Committee and the NC Stop Torture Now. Joan and any other people that are here with you who would like to come, please come forward. I'm going to read this proclamation. Whereas the city of Durham is home to a diverse population, is committed to the human and civil rights of all of its residents, is guaranteed by the Bill of Rights. And whereas on October 20th, 2003, the city of Durham adopted both the Bill of Rights Defense Resolution and the resolution supporting the rights of persons regardless of immigration status. And whereas torture is a blatant violation of human and civil rights, violating legal, faith, and ethical traditions, the U.S. Constitution, an international treaty such as the Convention Against Torture to which the U.S. is a signatory, and whereas the non-governmental North Carolina Commission of Inquiry on Torture, NCCIT, was held on November 30th and December 1st of this year to examine the role of North Carolina's airports, specifically those in Johnston County and at the Global Trans Park, which were used by aero contractors limited for its participation in the United States secret global torture program launched soon after September 11th, 2001, and will continue to investigate the testimony of its 20 witnesses with a view toward a full report to be issued in 2018. And whereas, according to witnesses at the NCCIT hearings, the 2000 investigation by the New York Times, and a 2012 UNC School of Law report, Aero Contractors, an aviation front company established by the CIA in 1979 at the Johnston County Airport in Smithfield, undertook a leading role in transporting detainees to secret, indefinite detention and torture, and was responsible for the rendition to torture at CIA black sites of a minimum of 33 detainees and for the rendition of at least 15 others to foreign governments known to torture. And whereas when governments fail to act, citizens have both a duty and an opportunity to do so, and citizen-led inquiries have a long and honorable history in North Carolina and beyond of exposing human rights abuses 
and creating momentum for accountability and redress. Now, therefore, I, Stephen M. Shule, Mayor of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim December 18th, 2017 as Human Rights Day and Bill of Rights Day in Durham, and urge all citizens to take special note of this observance and reaffirm our support of the Bill of Rights and of the civil liberties it guarantees to all residents of Durham and of North Carolina, and further to take special note of the work of the North Carolina Commission on Inquiry of, of Inquiry on Torture, a nonprofit organization created to address the issue of North Carolina's role in secret detention and torture, and to craft a model of accountability that can inspire similar efforts elsewhere. Witness my hand in the corporate seal of the city of Durham, North Carolina, this the 18th day of December, 2017. And now I'll ask Joan if she would like to come forward and say a few words. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Shule and members of the City Council. Just over two weeks ago, I attended the hearings held in Raleigh by the North Carolina Commission of Inquiry on Torture. Twenty witnesses were heard, including military officers, legal experts, and another member of North Carolina Stop Torture Now, who lives in Johnston County and works there to expose arrow contractors at considerable risk to her own livelihood. Most riveting were the Skype testimonies of one survivor of the U.S. torture program and the spouse of another survivor who is unable to testify himself. Both these survivors are good men who were in the wrong place at the wrong time, like so many who were tortured during the horrors of the previous decade. After these testimonies, there were tears in the eyes of the 200 or so people who were listening. So many lives have been destroyed by the U.S.'s illegal and useless torture program. It has damaged our country's reputation worldwide and provides cover for other countries to torture as well, including torturing our own captured troops. The NC commissioners determined beyond doubt that aero contractors should be prosecuted for war crimes. There must be accountability at the highest levels for these crimes, and survivors must be helped to rebuild their lives. Thank you for this proclamation and for Durham's strong stand in support of civil and human rights. Are there any announcements by the council? <clears throat> I do have one announcement. Uh, this is the final meeting, city council meeting, there'll be one more work session of our city clerk, the honorable <laughs> D. Ann Gray. Uh, we will be celebrating Ann in a way I will mention in a minute, but I do want to say that Ann has served for 33 years in the city of Durham and has been the city clerk for my six years on the council and does a remarkable job. Uh, she has a wonderful staff that she has brought together and the, one, of the, one of the real tributes to Anne is that her staff never leaves. They have been there. <laughs> the, the staff of our clerk's office has been serving, most of them, seriously, for many, many years. It is, a, it is a wonderful group of people that she has brought together, and it's because of her leadership that this is true. Uh, Anne, is, Anne keeps us on task. She keeps us organized. She makes sure that we're, compl we're complying with lots of different laws about public records and minutes and committee appointments, and we're just so grateful to her service. In the, on, on the third Monday of January, we will be honoring Anne in a more official way here at the, in these council chambers. And we will be on that day uh, declaring, let's see what that day is. Help me with the date, Anne. January 16th, Mr. Thank Chief. you, Charlie. It's Tuesday, if not Monday, Mr. Chief. All right, thank you. It'll be January a Tuesday. 16th. It'll be a Tuesday. It's after Martin Luther King Day. We will be declaring that day. D. Ann Gray Day in the city of Durham, North Carolina. And uh, we're all looking forward to it.
then you can come to the meeting and not have to worry about a daggone thing but accepting <laughs> the, the accolades. <laughs> Great. All right, uh, and now we'll, we'll move to the uh, first order of business, uh, the priority items. I recognize the city manager for any priority items. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone. No priority items from the city manager's office this evening. The, the city attorney. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I do want to bring to council's attention uh, that documents have been added to uh, GBA uh, item number two, city council vacancy. These are the three documents that were uh, created at the um, uh, council sub uh, subcommittee procedures procedures subcommittee meeting um, uh, last Wednesday. I just want to bring it to your attention and to the attention of the public to the extent that they want to take a look at that. Thank you. Do we need a motion? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. And then uh, any any items, for City Clerk? No, Mr. Mayor, no items. This is your last chance, Ann. Are you sure you don't want to have any items? I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, and now we'll move to our consent agenda. Um, the next order of business is the consent agenda. All items on the consent agenda may, may be approved by one vote unless an item is removed by a council member or a member of the public for separate consideration at the end of the meeting tonight. I'm going to read each of these items now. Item one, resolution for the city of Durham to become an intervening party in Duke Rate Case E-7 sub 1146. Item two can be found on the general business agenda. Item three, Durham City County Appearance Commission Interlocal Agreement Renewal. Item four, contract amendment one to the housing opportunities for persons with AIDS. Item five, amendment to contract for consulting and technical assistance engagement, phase two between the city of Durham and Enterprise Community Partners, Inc. Item six, purchase authorization for Go Durham replacement buses. Item seven, Southeast Regional Lift Station, amendment number one to the professional engineering services contract. Item eight, two inch water line replacement construction contract with JF Wilkerson Contracting Company, Inc. Item nine, Neighborhood Data Works contract to manage and operate the city's neighborhood compass. Item 10, contract SW50D for North Duke Street pedestrian improvements, TIP number EB5715. Item 11, contract SW51D for NC54 pedestrian improvements, TIP number EB-5708. Item 12, contract SW52D for LaSalle Street pedestrian improvements, TIP number EB-5703. Item 13, contract SW53D for Rainer Street pedestrian improvements, TIP number EB5704. Item 14, Odyssey Drive culvert replacement, SD2018-01, and Alpine Road culvert replacement, SD2018-02. Item 15 through 18 can be found on the general business agenda as public hearings. I will now entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda with the, uh, with, to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Any discussion? If not, all, oh, I guess we don't, we, we press our buttons, don't we? <laughs> we don't say ah. <laughs> uh, Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? I'm still getting the hang of it. Close the vote. It passes six to zero. Thank you very much. And now we'll move to the general business agenda. I'm going to um, change the order of this agenda a little bit, colleagues. I'm going to move item 18 uh, to be first, which is the FY 2018-19 annual action plan needs public hearing, uh, because I know we have a number of people here who would like to speak on that. Uh, so we'll be uh, moving that first. Does that work for you all? Mm -hmm. Thank you, staff. Uh, so we're now on item 18, FY 2018-19 annual action plan needs public hearing. Mayor Sheryl, Mayor Sheryl, <clears throat> members of the city council, Reginald Johnson, director of the Department of Community Development. The item before you is a public hearing, one of two public hearings that required uh, for the city of Durham to hold as part of the entitlement, federal entitlement process from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. The purpose of the public hearing is to receive uh, public comment as I said, it was first uh, one of two that you, we will hold before the adoption, proposal and adoption of the annual action plan in May of 2018. 
what I will do, I'll introduce to you uh, Ms. Wilma Conyers, Federal Programs Coordinator, who will introduce the uh, item and read into the record the certain um, uh, information that must be uh, shown in the record, and then we we'll can proceed with the public hearing. Thank you. Ms. Conyers. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Shule and members of council. Good evening. The purpose of this public hearing is to receive citizen comment on community development needs in Durham as it relates to the receipt of Community Development Block Grant, known as CDBG, the Home Investment Partnership Program, known as HOME, the Emergency Solutions Grant, known as ESG, and Housing Opportunities for Persons with AIDS, known as HOPWA. This public hearing is the requirement for the preparation and submission of the city's FY18-19 Annual Action Plan. This meeting was properly advertised in the Herald Sun and via general listserv. <coughs> As a recipient of CDBG, home, ESG, and HOPWA funds, the city is required to hold at least two public hearings prior to the submission of the annual action plan. The first meeting must be held early in the development stage of the plan. We anticipate the second public hearing will be held approximately late April or early May. In addition, the city is required to publish a copy of the draft annual action plan for at least 30 days prior to its submission. The city's annual action plan must be submitted to HUD by May 15th. The Department of Housing and Urban Development has not yet announced the FY18-19 entitlement allocations. So for planning purposes, the city expects to receive approximately 1.8 million in CDBG funds, 800,000 in home funds, approximately 160,000 in ESG, and 328,000 in HOPWA funds. In closing, a summary of these comments from this public hearing and written comments received from citizens during the development of the annual action plan will be incorporated into the FY 2018-2019 annual action plan. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. <clears throat> you, are, you have heard the report from the staff and I'll declare the public hearing to be open and I will first entertain Questions and comments from the City Council. Any questions or comments for staff? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was wondering if you all um, could respond to um, the questions that we've been getting today via email from some of the um, homeless services organizations about allocations for homeless services funding in the um, budget. Uh, yes, I'm Reginald Johnson, uh, Director of the Department of Community Development. Uh, to the extent that I'm uh, familiar with the questions, the questions involve uh, what are the allocations for homelessness services. So this will be part of the recommendations for homelessness services. We do not have any allocations rec in terms of uh, open up the application process for CDBG as we have in the past. What our plan is that we will build next year, so this is a little bit premature, we're going to use dedicated housing fund to increase overall increase the funding for the homelessness system. There's some things that we do need to work on as according to the uh, report that was from Focus Strategies, which includes several different areas which I'll go into, but are not part of this funding. Okay, thank you. Do you have a sense of why these concerns were brought up? There were very specific numbers attached, which made me think that people had been looking at a budget that, met, that was from your office that had specific amounts that were being allocated to different like funding pots. The questions reference the application process that was just opened. Okay. And in terms of CDBG, uh, in the past we have had uh, opened up about 130,000 for homelessness oh. services, which we did not have in this particular uh, process for CDBG. Uh, in terms of the ESG allocation, uh, we opened up the process with uh, the entire amount to be allocated toward uh, rapid rehousing. So is the plan for that funding to be provided by the dedicated housing fund instead of the federal funding? Uh, one of the things that we're going to talk about in the next next year is uh, what are the priorities for our homelessness housing system. And so we will look at that. 
but there are some other items that are actually from the report that look in terms of uh, will be more important in terms of our homelessness system. For example, uh, coordinated intake uh, will be was one of the items that was listed in the uh, report. Reginald, when do you uh, anticipate that the uh, focus strategies report will be presented to either the city council or the joint city county committee? Since I think previously this was a joint city county committee discussion. I would suspect uh, probably around February. One of the things that the Homeless Services Advisory Committee, who has already received the report, uh, they're rec making recommendations so that we're not just presenting a report and findings, but also solutions. Uh, that will come in time for our budget process. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, if I might. Um, uh, yes, Council Member Middleton, and then uh, Council Member Freeman, then Council Member Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Reginald, for all the work the staff does. This is more of a, a I guess, a statement question. So at this very moment, because there are a lot of people concerned, is, is it fair to say that at this very moment, no decision has been made that will impact funding levels as we stand here tonight, as we sit here tonight, for homeless services in, in the city? So one of the things that's important is how we define homelessness services. As I shared with you, we're looking at it from the system level. Uh, and what we did when we opened up the process, we opened it up a little different. There will be a shifting of priorities that we will discuss next year. We're going to uh, include our, our federal funding as well as our local funding uh, in terms of increasing the overall funding for the homelessness system is what will be proposed. It's a little bit premature right now. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, thank you, John, um, Reginald. Uh, I, I just wanted to follow up on Middleton's question and just ask a more specific question around, will the homelessness, homelessness services be wrapped into some of the housing conversation? Because I think I asked this question re like earlier around whether or not um, our, affordable, uh, our affordable housing conversation was actually going to be moved into more of the mainstream of how funds are distributed. And I know that homeless services are under your department, so I just wanted to make sure that that is also included in our affordable, affordability from zero all the way up to 80 or 120, whatever the percentage is in a more collaborative way. Yes, that is the plan that we have uh, proposed for the uh, next spring as we part of the budget process, if you, well, you may not know that the uh, previous city council, in terms of the Enterprise Community Partners report, uh, make, ask us to focus uh, specifically on uh, the homeless housing system, which we did, and how we did that, we incorporated, uh, had the Enterprise Community Partners to engage uh, focus strategies, a firm out of California, to help study our homelessness system, and based upon those reports, we'll be actually be looking at uh, what we need to do to strengthen our homeless housing system. There are some, there are some specific items, and it will be uh, comprehensive. And I want to make sure that in addition to the comprehensive side of services is also within the organizations that do partner with us, that there's some look at who's on the boards of these organizations and who's providing the services, that they, they're representative of the population that's being served. Uh, yes, we do follow the homelessness of HUD requirements. One of them is specifically is that members of uh, organizations that service a homeless, uh, members of the homeless community have a homeless person or a formerly homeless person on their board. And that is something that we do uh, look at. Thank you. That will be part of our process, continue to be part of our process. Council Member Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you for that information, Reginald. I appreciate it. appreciate all the work that goes into trying to implement the strategy that we gave you last year. <clears throat> um, I just want to clarify some of the information that we've received from the advocacy organizations to make sure that we're talking the same language about the same money. Is it true that previously a HUD CDBG funds were available for homeless activities um, in Durham? Yes, that is true. And is it now true that because of a decision that's been made in the administration those funds are no longer available for homeless services. That is true. Based upon the application that was opened, yes. For CDBG money. For CDBG. Right. That's but so the CDBG funding that was previously made available for homeless activities is no longer available. That is correct. Is it also true that the ESG program, the Emergency Solutions Grant program, 
that typically rewards somewhere, awards somewhere in the neighborhood of $153,000 for eligible activities around homeless services has now been uh, allocate, now being allocated solely to rapid rehousing activities. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And is it true that there was a funding workshop recently where this was explained to the nonprofits and eligible agencies that typically apply for funding through these two programs for homeless services? Yes, that is correct. Okay. Can you help me understand what those agencies were told at that workshop about whether they would be eligible for some other type of funding in the future? I can tell you that we did not discuss other funding because the focus of that workshop was one dedicated housing fund as well as our federal entitlement process uh, funding. Uh, so we did not discuss what will become available in the future. So you told the, these agencies and nonprofits at this funding workshop that two of the main sources of funding that they have in the budget from the city were no longer be, gonna be available to them but didn't tell them they might be able to get money from the city in another way in the future? That's correct. Does that, did you mean to do that? Did we mean to do that? Well, what I would share with you is to look at the purpose of the funding workshop. The purpose of the funding workshop is to outline the funding that is gonna be available for, for this particular workshop and what is the application process uh, in relative detail uh, for that. That's the purpose of the workshop. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, if All right, I might. Thank you for that information, I appreciate it. Uh, city Manager. Reginald, could you clarify to what extent uh, the, this staff recommendation was made to the Homeless Services Advisory Committee and uh, what the Homeless Services Advisory Committee's uh, recommendation was in that regard? So we did not uh, present to the Homeless Services Advisory Committee any recommendations on CDBG uh, funding. We normally do not do that. Uh, what we do for the Homeless Services Advisory Committee is at the end of the process uh, that we do make present the recommendations as it relates to ESG to the uh, Homeless Services Advisory Committee for their review and approval. So then could you clarify why the staff made the, uh, the recommended uh, allocation change in priority? Yes, yes I can and I'll be glad to. So one of the things that's important is that we look at the analysis that has come back from focus strategies in terms of our homelessness system. One of the city's key roles is to focus on the system, not necessarily an individual organization. There's some key weaknesses that are in our system. One of them is that, uh, yes, we have persons that are in a shelter, but we need to be able to find places for those persons to go. And so that means uh, housing navigation and into in in finding places, places for pe persons to go. So that's one pay piece, piece that we are going to be working on. Another piece is the coordinated intake, particularly for those persons who are individuals. We do some uh, work with families, but the vast majority of those persons who are homeless are, in, are single persons. But we have no coordinated intake system uh, for those persons, and the federal uh, mandate uh, from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development is going to force us to prioritize that particular piece uh, in terms of coordinating. The third thing is that in terms of the housing management information system with this data that we use to gather and track homelessness systems, we've been part of a statewide system, but it has not serviced our needs at all. And so one of the things that we're going to be have to to do is to, uh, in some respects, go with a smaller regional coalition of uh, continuum of cares to get the needs, uh, get our needs met. And I believe that recommendation was approved by the Homeless Service Advisory yes, Committee last month. that was approved month. by the Homeless Services Advisory Committee, and that we are doing analysis to come up with the final number uh, on that. It's going to involve some other uh, players across the state uh, in terms of our provider, but yes, that uh, was recommended by the Homeless Services Advisory Committee. Thank you. Thank you, Council Members, and thank you very much, Reginald. And now we will hear from members of the public, and then Council Members will have another opportunity to ask questions and so forth. I'm going to read the names of the people who have signed up to speak. There are 21 people who have signed up to speak. Um, each speaker will be given three minutes. I'm going to read your names, and as I read them, uh, if you could come over to this side of the room uh, to be speaking at this podium. 
uh, Ryan Furman, Walena Lorraine Day, Leighton Short, I'm sorry, Lee Ann Short, I apologize, Lee Ann Short, John Harden, Peter Gilbert, Jay Harris, Kelly Mitchell, Marsha McNally, Tony Tosh, Deontay Devone, I'm sorry if I did not get that name right, Jason Devone, Olu Tosh, Eric Smith, Earl, Bra Earl Bradley, and Sandy Demery. So that would just be one person. Uh, are, they, is there, are, are they both here? Just, are Earl Bradley and Sandy Demery both here? If so, raise your hands. Sandy, I see you. Okay. All right. You all have signed up. I assume this means you both want to speak. Is that correct? Okay. So we'll have, I'll call on you each separately. Yolanda Brown, Colleen Herbert, Carolyn E. Hinton, Linnea Foster, Angel Lewis, Annie Pioglu, I'm not sure I can read the handwriting. Okay, and Sandy, I see you've signed up again. Okay, so, great. Anyone else? Would like to anyone else that would like to uh, sign up to speak, please sign up card right here at the clerk's table. Sign up here at the clerk's table, please. All right, we will begin now with Ryan Furman. You have three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's truly a, a privilege to be able to address this council uh, as a member of a nonprofit. We have kept to sit on the sidelines for the election, but I really watched your campaigns with interest. Many of you campaigned on trying to level the playing field for low-income populations in our community and people of color. Many of the organizations you're going to hear from tonight are trying to do just that. We are on the front lines of poverty in our community, trying to move homeless households into permanent housing and connect them with employment and services. Ryan, what you've, Ryan excuse me a minute. I'm sorry. Yes. Would you please give your name and address? I apologize. Yes. Should have said that originally. I'm Ryan Furman. I live at 1406 Norton Street here Thank in Durham. You. So the proposal you've heard from community development tonight effectively zeroes out the community, community development block grant funds for all of Durham. And the, the proposal regarding the emergency solutions grant would only fund rapid rehousing. So organizations that do homeless shelter, that do shelter services, that do street outreach, that do food, none of these agencies would even be eligible for funding. And I wanna be clear, th this is not based on outcomes or, per or performance. The agencies that provide many of these services are high performing and meeting or exceeding community standards set by our Homeless Services Advisory Committee. So this, has, this is not about ineffectiveness. This would have a tremendous impact on families, families moving forward and many of our partners. So we receive $50,000 in, in CDBG funds for case management that effectively covers a full-time case manager with benefits at the shelter that's working every day with our families and trying to move them into permanent housing. We also received just over $40,000 in emergency solutions grant funding for shelter operations. With the cost of our shelter program, that basically runs our shelter for about two weeks. Under the current proposal, we would go from roughly $92,000 to $0 and would not be eligible to reapply in any of the categories where we had formerly applied. I want to voice clear support that we believe in our affordable housing plan in Durham. This is an absolutely necessary step that y'all are taking. We need places for our families to, to live. We believe in rapid rehousing. We partner with our friends at Housing for New Hope. They help get our families out of the shelter and into permanent affordable housing in our community. We are acting like this is a zero sum game with no new resources in our community. We have added a second penny on the tax rate, which in my understanding will bring five and a half to six million dollars more per, per year when that, mon when that money comes in. So I don't feel like there is a need to defund what we're doing at our, at our shelters and on the front line in order to pay for housing. We're an entitlement community because of our poverty rate. That money is designed to help low-income and homeless households make a better start in their lives. Let's keep it where it's supposed to be. So I'm saying this with full understanding of, of the gravity of this, of this sentiment, but I have to say this. I am losing confidence in our leadership at the Department of Community Development. 
This decision was not made with any input from the Homeless Services Advisory Committee, the Citizens Advisory Committee, the Council to End Homelessness, or any other group that's involved with homeless services activity in this community. It wasn't communicated the impact. We didn't even know until we showed up at, at the funding workshop. Now we're hearing that it's not maybe not a final decision. If you go to the community development website tonight and look at the PowerPoint from the funding workshop last Tuesday the 12th, it clearly says no CDBG, no ESG for anything other than rehousing, and tonight we get vague promises about future funding. It's not good enough. We need this money for poor and homeless folks in this community. So I, I'm asking you to please intervene. If this is a basic needs hearing, I'm gonna say we need CDBG, we need ESG for homeless households. Please do the right thing. Thank you very much. Walena Lorraine Day. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, um, members of the City Council. My name is Kevin McNamee. I'm a social worker and a family services coordinator with Families Moving Forward. I'm here to read a written statement by Ms. Day. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, we're, we're happy to take the written statement, and sure. if you could hand that to the clerk, would be great. Sure. But people have to speak for themselves here. Fair Thank enough. you very much. But we are happy to take the statement. It will be distributed. Thank okay. you. Thank you so much. And now uh, we'll hear from Leanne Short. Please state your name and address. Hello. Hello, everyone. My name is Leanne Shore. My address is 300 North Queen Street. And this is, and this is my daughter, Aaliyah. Um, I, was a, I was living in a very nice two-bedroom apartment with my daughter, um, working full-time. In May, my car broke down, so I had to start riding the city bus. And then when I started riding the city bus, I started losing hours because, as everyone knows, the bus is not like a car. So basically, I just started getting behind on my bills, and I couldn't keep my rent up any longer. So in October, I received an eviction notice. I called all the shelters around Durham, and all of them was full. It just so happened that families moving forward called me and said they had a room available for me and my daughter to come stay. If they hadn't called me, I would have been on the streets with my daughter, and I would have definitely lost my child. And definitely I would have lost my job, but more important, I would have lost my little girl. I'm sorry. Take your time, Ms. Short. It's okay. But while I'm at Families Moving Forward, I get to keep my job. I go to work every day. I feel safe. I feel safe there with my daughter. Families Moving Forward has helped me in the process of finding my own place. So it's so important to me to to fund shelters like Families Moving Forward, because like I said, for families like mine, it's a place to land in hard times because I'm a single mom, and that thought that day of having to live on the street with my child, that's a bad feeling. So I just thank God for Families Moving Forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Short. We're now here from John Harden. Hi, John Harden. I live at 2 Surrey Lane here in Durham. Thank you very much for allowing me to provide input on this important issue, specifically the allocation of CDBG and ESG funding away from homeless activities to activities associated with the city's affordable housing plan, as we heard earlier. For the past two years, I have served as the president of the board of directors of Families Moving Forward and we have learned about Families Moving Forward from the previous speakers. Prior to becoming president of Families Moving Forward, I volunteered for 17 years with the Durham Interfaith Hospitality <coughs> Network, where I interacted with hundreds of homeless families to help them get back on their feet, learn new skills, and thrive. I've been a resident of Durham for 20 years. During that time, I have watched this community change a lot, and I recently heard a <coughs> saying that sums up those changes. It goes like this. Durham kept the cool, took the brains out of Chapel Hill, and left the boring in Raleigh. Now, I work in Raleigh and in Chapel Hill, and I love those communities, but my family and I specifically chose to live in Durham because of its cool. It's a big part of which is due to Durham's sense of community. Fundamental to this community is how we help our least advantaged, the poorest of the poor, families literally in the crisis of homelessness. 
The CDBG and ESG funding have been critical for supporting the front end continuum for these families, of care for these families. In fact, it's my understanding that if the CDBG and ESG funding were to be directed to other activities, organizations like Families Moving Forward would receive no funding from the City of Durham. In particular, the CDBG funding is enough to support at least one full-time position at Families Moving Forward, a case manager who works directly with families, such as the, the family you just saw, to help them get back on their feet. These skills are critical for leading a happy, healthy, productive, and prosperous life. The more people who learn them up front, the less our need <coughs> for low-income housing on the back end. My understanding that, was that the decision to redirect CDBG and ESG funding away from homeless activities to other activities was made with little or no public input. As a longtime resident of Durham and as a volunteer helping homeless families, I urge you to keep the CDBG and ESG funding for homeless activities in the 2018-19 budget process and future granting and grant cycles. This would be an effective and efficient way to help minimize our need for low-income housing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harden. And now we'll hear from Peter Gilbert. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. Um, uh, passed an article to Council Member Reese that I hope you'll take a look at. My name is Peter Gilbert. I live on 601 Swan Street uh, in Durham, North Carolina. And I'm a staff attorney with Legal Aid of North Carolina, where I represent tenants facing eviction uh, here in Durham, uh, much like the tenant that you just heard from. So um, the last thing that I want to do is to be in competition for funding with organizations like Families Moving Forward and that work that is currently provided by the direct providers to homelessness. And I hope that will continue. But I also want to speak about uh, the eviction crisis, which I think is a necessary part of any conversation about homelessness in Durham. Um, many cities have realized that by investing in providing counsel to tenants who are facing eviction, they can actually save money in the long run in terms of homeless, homeless providers. I hope I don't need to tell anybody about the eviction crisis that Durham is facing and the numbers that you've seen, the excellent reporting done in The Independent, and, and uh, there was recently an article in the Durham Herald Sun that Durham has the highest rate of evictions of any of the 10 most populous counties in North Carolina. Um, we know that affordable housing funding overall is in decline federally, and the number of subsidized housing units is in decline uh, overall. So most of the low-income and low-wealth families in Durham are going to be relying on the private unsubsidized market, and that's not going to change in Durham. And so if we want to have a conversation about preventing homelessness and providing uh, affordable housing in Durham, a big part of that conversation has to be addressing the 800 evictions a month that are filed in Durham a number which is both under and over inclusive in terms of the number of people displaced due to eviction. Many people are forced out without there ever being an eviction filing. Some of those who are filed against are able to work something out with their landlord and avoid um, being removed by the sheriff. Um, I'm hoping that when the city does its analysis uh, of fair housing, what used to be called the analysis of impediments to fair housing, that's now the assessment of fair housing, that this eviction crisis will be part of that, uh, as I think it is an obstacle to fair housing in Durham. Um, other cities have recognized uh, that funding attorneys to represent tenants in eviction is a cost-effective way to deal with homelessness. New York City has recently adopted a, a program to fund a right to counsel, to fund a lawyer in every eviction case, because they realized that they could save $320 million a year that they're already spending on direct service to shelters and other providers. I don't think we can afford to cut the services that are currently being provided, like I said, to families moving forward and the other shelters. But I think that as part, of, as part of the conversation for funding affordable housing going forward in Durham, we need to consider uh, funding attorneys to represent tenants in eviction cases. The consequences of evictions are not just the individual consequences. The, the loss of a job, as we heard about earlier, the children being displaced from school, they're also the intangible consequences of the breakup of our neighborhoods, but it contributes also to the rise in housing costs in Durham overall. Every time an eviction occurs, every time somebody is displaced, the rents tend to go up. The most cost-effective way to deal with affordable housing and homelessness in Durham is to keep people in the homes that they're already in and to keep those neighborhoods together. So as part of that, I hope that you will um, learn what the other cities have learned and consider funding uh, um, tenants um, to have lawyers in eviction cases. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gilbert. 
We'll now hear from Jay Harris. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, our Good elected evening. officials. Good afternoon. Jay Harris, 1023 Cook Road here in Durham, North Carolina. I stand here to represent as the chairperson for Healing with Care here in Durham, North Carolina. And we have been committed for over the past 22 years in the fight against poverty, AIDS, and homelessness. In creating our strategic plan for the upcoming year and years, we need funding. Like other agencies that aforementioned, and the other numbers have been given out, so I won't go over that again. We have, our, our agencies have been repeatedly denied, and the upcoming plan looks very bleak. And I have a question. Is it the mission of Durham, the city of Durham, to relocate the homeless population out of the city of Durham? If it's not, it has the appearance of that very thing. Our agencies need your help. People who are sleeping under bridges need your help. Families living in cars need your help. Please help us. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Harris. And now we'll hear from Kelly Mitchell. Hello, Mr. Mayor and uh, City Council. Uh, my name is Kelly Mitchell. I stay at 1508 Great Bend Drive. And, um, um, I was in treatment for 90 days. Um, after I left treatment, um, I was afforded employment and housing immediately at um, Prosperity Recovery. And um, um, we're just asking to please fund our request of $500,000 to help ensure job training, housing, rapid rehousing for Prosperity Recovery and Care Incorporated. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mitchell. And now we'll hear from Marsha McNally. Uh, Marsha McNally, 203 North Church Street, Durham. I'm here on behalf of the Affordable Housing Coalition, and we are in the process of uh, formulating a more formal comment on um, this funding source, but uh, before the year ended, we wanted to do something a little different than we usually do. We usually wrangle with you all um, on a daily or weekly basis. And rather than do that, we wanted to acknowledge the city council and the staff's work and leadership on moving the ball forward on affordable housing generally in 2017. Um, a short list of accomplishments include, include uh, giving DHA, I think, $4.3 million for Fayette Place, uh, increasing the um, tax to two cents, uh, hiring new staff to implement the affordable housing plan, neighborhood stabilization, uh, Jackson Street um, being significantly about affordable housing, the extent to which it's about um, housing. Let's see, I've got a list. Uh, for those of you who are running for office, participating in the candidate forums and pledging to make affordable housing a high on your priority list. And there's probably a lot of other things that we don't even know about, but we just wanted to um, give you our um, appreciation. And we have cards for you to express that. You can just leave them with the clerk. Please leave them with the clerk. Thank you very much, Ms. McNally. And now we will hear from Tony Tosh. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening. Good evening to the city manager and the city council. Mr. I'm Tosh. the owner of Postparity Mr. Recovery. Mr. Tosh, excuse me one second. Could you give your name and address? My name, my name is Tony Tosh. I live in 133 Woodgrove Street in Dome. Thank you. I want to thank all of you guys for having me here. But I'm the owner of Postparity Recovery. And I've been walking people from the shelter, training them a job trade. I'm very emotional. Oh, forgive me if I start a little bit. But people from the shelter, the old mayor, Mr. Bill, introduced me to, introduced me to some gang member of Few old Few Garden and um, Maduku Terrors. I work those guys, train them, give them a trade to learn how to learn how to eat on themselves when they need when they graduate from our program. Now 
I'm working people from the homeless shelter. I have people from the homeless shelter that I work, I train, and I move them to my house, Ruben and houses. I have about 10 people, a couple of them with me here today. We need help. I've been using my money to fund this program, but I don't have no money no more. People like care, family move forward. They're small company, and they need help. Uh, care helps me out every now and then with financial power when I run through, don't have enough money to make a payroll to my guys. Please help us, Mr. Mayor, city manager. You know, please help us to support us with all the small business people like me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Tosh. We will near, now hear from Deontay Devone. I'm, if I got your name wrong, I apologize. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Deontay Devon. And, um, and I, and I um, just graduated school. Where do high you school. reside, Mr. Devon? Can you repeat that? Where do you live? What's your address? 55 Dayton Street. Thank you. Um, and I just graduated high school. And um, thanks to Mr. Tosh, he gave me a job with um, Prospective uh, Recovery. And and glad, because it's kind of changing stuff for me. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Very much appreciate your being here. And I want to thank you, Mr. Tosh, for the work you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you. And good luck to you. And now we're here from Jason Devon. Hey, how you doing, Mr. Mayor and Council? If I'm pronouncing it right. That's my nephew right there. Um, I stay in McDougal Terrace, 255 Dayton Street. And what we do, working for Tony Tosh on the Prosperity Recovery, I'm a skills tradesman, and what I do, my job is we're trying to get all the young guys like him a chance. I'm going to teach them the trade. I'm going to show them the trade. Painting, carpentry is what we do, and show them how to eat, how to live, and try to make their own way. Instead of guns and drugs, get them off the street and train them. That's the problem that we have. We don't have enough older guys like ourselves that's willing to train our young guys to show them a right way to live. So that's what we that's what all prosperity is about, is just getting the young guys off the street, getting the drugs, leave the drugs alone, leave the guns alone. Come on, I'm gonna show you how to work. And once you learn this skill, you can eat forever. You can always make money to take care of yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Devone. And we'll now hear from Olu Tosh. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, City of Councilor, and Mr. Manager for giving me the time to speak tonight. My name is Eric, and when I was staying at- Are you Eric Smith, Mr.? Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Hang on one second, okay? Is Olu Tosh here? Oh, okay, you're next? All right, go ahead, Mr. Smith. My apologies, we'll do it that way. That's fine. When I was staying at the shelter for three months until I met Tony Tosh, CEO of Prosperity Recovery Services, he gave me employment and place place of my own. And if it wasn't for Tosh, I would still be at the shelter now. More people need to be able to benefit from prosperity recovery services and care. Please fund care, DCRC, and prosperity recovery services request for five, $500,000. Thank you very much, Mr. Smith. We appreciate you being here. Thank you. You're welcome. And good luck to you. And now we hear from Olu Tosh. Hello, Council. Thank you for taking the time to hear what I have to say. Um, my name is Olu Tosh. I live on 832 Woodgrove Street. And throughout the years, and um, while I've been staying in Durham, I've helped volunteer with Prosperity throughout my high school to learn trades and also help find nonprofits that can also support what they're doing. Um, and I would just like to say that, in my opinion, um, more people could benefit from prosperity, and I think that it's a great cause. Um, and I would just like to say I support the DRC and CARE and the request along with prosperity for 50000 um, And that's about it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Tosh. 
And now uh, we'll hear from Earl Bradley. Good evening. I live at 1807 Palmer Street, Durham, North Carolina. Um, I'm with the Durham Community Land Trust. And what we are is like a lot of people that I know have like vouchers that it's hard to find housing, affordable housing. And it's like community land trust, we, they basically work off donations. And if we don't have enough donations, how can we fix up the properties for these families? And most of them live off social security and it's like, they can't find nothing and it's hard and, or they lose, they lose their voucher. And so Durham Community Land Trust try to give them a chance to, to find places. And we got property that need to be fixed and it's like, we can't get no help to fix them up. Like, so what can they do? Thank you very much, Mr. Bradley. And now we're here from Sandy Demery. I'm Sandy Demery and I'm at 819 North Street and I'm thrilled you guys are here because I know you're all about affordable housing so it's very exciting. Uh, I'm also with DCLT, Durham Community Land Trustees, um, which we think of as a great solution for Durham's permanent affordable housing needs. I've, I'm on the board, I've been there for about 10 years now and I'm specifically involved with community engagement and a lot of that is about making a difference. And um, so we've been in the West End and South Side and now over in East Durham. And East Durham, I was so surprised to see the shape these properties are in. You probably all know the history. Uh, they would have been sold to an investor in New York and torn down and then the folks in them probably would have been on the street. So we took the risk and these 53 units um, to make sure to keep these tenants in place. Um, but they're unsafe, unacceptable housing for the way you or I would think that they should be. Um, I know that uh, during the Durham CAN meeting, the, those of you who are running and uh, for office pledged to help fund the, the large need that we have for those 53 units over the next couple years. It's a big project. So we're going to need multi-year strategy planning to do the fix-up, kind of like the capital improvement programs, multi-year planning. It would be nice if that we could do something like that for affordable housing. Um, please help us continue to help meet your goals about not displacing people, focusing on low-income residents, uh, and to bring these units up to par. Uh, it's getting urgent, winter's coming. Um, these folks are gonna be cold and they're gonna be spending way too much money on electric heat um, because of bad insulation. So um, this whole idea of making a difference, uh, I'm visualizing, hoping that Jose will be happy in his apartment over on Park Avenue. And I'm hoping that you'll help us with making a difference there also. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Demery. And we'll now hear from Yolanda Brown. Hello, Mr. Mayor and City Council. I'm Yolanda Brown. I live at 140 President's Drive in Ward 3. And I am, have been on the Board of Directors for four years for Urban Ministries of Durham and I'm currently the Board Chair. And so I'm here um, just to share a little bit about UMD. We are the primary homeless shelter and emergency service provider for our Durham neighbors experiencing homelessness um, and poverty. We, I am here to oppose the elimination of HUD, CBD, CDBG, and ESG funding for homeless activities. Urban Ministries of Durham and Families Moving Forward provide a dignified place downtown for our neighbors to go for help. And UMD is currently providing shelter for over 140 men, women, and children today. Beyond shelter, UMD provides breakfast, lunch, and dinner seven days a week uh, to anyone who was hungry through the community cafe. That's nearly 5,000 meals per year, or more than a quarter million free meals each year. Uh, CDBG funds are critical for the operation of that community cafe. We also provide access to a clothing closet and food pantry for families um, and working poor in Durham. For Durham citizens who are homeless, 
We provide case management, workforce training, and placement assistance in aftercare. Uh, with these services, we are on, on track to help about 300 people in their homelessness this year, this fiscal year. The city of Durham, downtown business, and everyone in the community benefit from having these services available. Helping individuals secure employment income to pay for housing, providing case management to help with this housing search, apply for vouchers or advocate with landlords, and offering access to food and clothing to stretch precious household services uh, resources are all services that should be supported in some part by the city of Durham. However, each activity has a cost, and the loss of any funding that supports this work would make it challenging to continue to provide all of these services to people who just need some help. Um, the current modest investment by the city is leveraged by private and foundation dollars to support thousands of Durhamites in poverty and help over 100 people in homelessness every year, which is projected to triple this year. The loss of funding for the services our partners in the fight against homelessness are facing will put a further strain on all of us in meeting these needs. Um, given the certain uncertainties in our country, our state, and in our city, for our low-income neighbors, we need these services to stay intact now more than ever. So considering the cost of the city providing of all these services, if it had to do so directly, um, I'm certain the city and the residents would do their part to support organizations uh, working with our most vulnerable residents. So my appeal is to ask that you will continue to allocate at least the current portion of the CDBG block grants for homeless activities for now and in future grant cycles. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Ms. Brown. And now we'll hear from Colleen Herbert. Would you please state your name and address? Sure, Colleen Herbert, and my address is 3505 Weatherby Drive. Um, thank you all for this opportunity to speak this evening. I am resident of Durham, parishioner in Northeast Central Durham, and I am a member of the Homeless Services Advisory Committee. As a member, I'm here to support all of the organizations who provide services to persons with issues of housing security. We need to ensure that there is funding diversity to provide equitable housing options for the residents of Durham where it's needed the most. And so I'd further like to state that I am in support of the requests of the agencies that have spoken before me and that are here tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Herbert. And now we'll hear from Carolyn E. Hinton. Good afternoon, council members and mayor. Good afternoon. I'm here on behalf of Healing Ms. with Hinton, Care. My your... name is Carolyn Thank E. You. Hinton. Thank you. My address is 5418 Whip Corwell Street, Durham, North Carolina. Thank you. Yeah. And I'm on behalf of my business, Healing with Care, who provide homelessness services for veterans and others. What I've done is propose a needs list and I will provide it to you so that you can see it from our available funding that is designed to end homelessness. First, we need diversity in funding for all populations, domestic violence, veterans, and people living with chronic diseases. Right now, agencies like Healing with Care Durham Crisis Response Center, Triangle Empowerment Center, ACRA, and others are not being considered for funding. CARE and DCRC maintain state and federal grants and formally received state ESG funding, but now the City Department of Community Development has eliminated their participation in the federal mandates for housing. By excluding CARE, DCRC, and others, we diminish the impact of services to our target populations. We need 
$200,000 for emergency assistance and rapid rehousing for homeless people, including people with chronic illnesses like HIV, diabetes, domestic violence, substance abuse, and reentry. Second, we need to expand services for those who need and qualify for affordable housing. Currently, the affordable housing plan does not meet the needs of the homeless and low-income people in this community. Citizens of Durham have increasing difficulty finding safe and affordable housing. Every day, our agency is challenged with seeking safe and affordable housing without support. We need $200,000 to support programs that invest in rehousing, counseling, training, reentry, and income building, such as the agency operated by Tony Tosh. We need to look at the long-term versus the short-term outcomes and support a workforce being able to afford housing. Third, we needed coordinated intake to provide access to homeless programs. It is the only way to fairly and equitably provide service to everyone. Thank you very much, Ms. Hinton. Um, I asked to sign up for one of my board members, but since she's not here, I have it in written form and I will give it to your secretary. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Uh, and now we'll hear from Linnea Foster. Members of the council, uh, Mr. Manager. Uh, my name is Linnea Foster. I'm at 1327 Kendall Drive. I'm here to talk to you today about um, the CDBG, ESG, and home funds and how they're being allocated. Um, today, I'm here to request $500,000 in funding. Um, first, we wanna ask that you invest in funding diversity. Agencies that serve specific populations need to be funded. Domestic violence, veterans, um, other groups, they're, they're ignored. Right now, they are marginalized and the funding allocations are biased and they include racial and gender inequities. Lesser known agencies like CARE and DCRC receive federal money and state money, but are unable to receive ESG here in our community um, since the city took over and they have never been successful. These continuous practice not practices not only injure and diminish the value of long-standing community agencies, it harms the people they serve. Two, we want to expand those served by affordable housing. It takes the whole continuum to keep someone housed. The current affordable housing plan in Durham doesn't meet the needs for most homeless and low-income people. We need homes that programs that invest in rehousing, counseling, training, and building income to help people transition to housing from the long term. Affordable housing begins with the workforce. Three, fund coordinated intake. We have to stop the limited approach of prioritization, but just by just helping one area. HUD wants us to create a functional system that supports the entire homeless system, chronics families, veterans, youth, sick, healthy, black, white, Latino, women, men, young, and old. Our community is not fully utilizing all the beds available. We aren't housing the homeless quickly. Our system is actually keeping homeless people homeless longer. No one should have to sleep on the street in Durham. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Foster. And now we will hear from Angel Lewis. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Angel Lewis, and I live in a hotel right now. I'm home. This is my self and my grandson. I, although I have a Section 8 voucher, I find it hard to find housing for him and myself. I'm in this hotel for two weeks. Someone put us up in it for two weeks. And after that, 
I don't know where we're going. I've been out every day, every week, with the help of my friend Rita, helping me to find different places. I even went to this affordable housing meeting today to learn more about who, 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 who can help me and my grandson. I went to the shelters. I did everything everyone told me to do. And I'm still homeless. They was telling me if I have somewhere to sleep at night that I'm not considered homeless. But after these two weeks, uh, I guess it takes me to be out in the street to be considered homeless. I just ask for your help, please. Thank so, you, thank you, Ms. Lewis. Ms. Lewis, did you say you do have a Section 8 voucher? Yes, sir. You do? How long have you had it? 20 years. So, I just moved down here three years ago. I still have my voucher, and I've been going out to different houses, but they say that I don't qualify for the rent. When, did you, when was the last time that you had a house that, that you were using your voucher to pay for? As of the 13th of oh. November. Of November? Oh, no, no, 13th of December. December was the last time. So, so that was... Just a few days ago. It was ago. just last Wednesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Okay, so and you you are now out looking, using your voucher, looking for a place to live. Is that what you're I've trying? been doing it, yes, sir. And I went to housing twice, but it was turned down because they said I didn't have, have the right income for my voucher and the place that I was looking for. Okay. Um, would you, um, you've been in touch with the Durham Housing Authority? Yes. And you have one of their vouchers. Yes. Is that correct? Okay. Um, I'm going to ask uh, if a member of our staff uh, could talk with you after the meeting yes. and, uh, and, and, and maybe get in touch again with the Durham Housing Authority Section 8 staff. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, next, next speaker. I'm sorry, I'm, I can't really read this last name. I apologize. Annie Pioglu? Maybe so. Rigsby? Yes. Okay, could yes, be. Yes, sir. Uh, Are you Eddie Rigsby? Uh, no, I'm a son. Okay, is, is Annie Rigsby here? No, sir. Okay, you, would you like to speak? Yes, sir. Okay, have you signed up? Yes. Okay, what's your name? Frederick Morris Johnson. Uh, my mother's a little sickly. Hang on just a second, sir. Frederick Morris Johnson? Yes, sir. Okay, Mr. Johnson, could you state your name and address? You have three minutes. Thank you. Okay, uh, my name is Frederick Morris Johnson. Uh, I live at 3418 Mordecai Apartment H in Durham. My mother stays at 1013 North Guthrie. Um, I want to talk about the uh, the familiar project, and um, my mother is running out of her voucher in January, and I think she needs more time. She paid her deposit, and um, and plus she's kind of sickly a little bit, and um. She's um she's a wonderful person. She um my father worked at Duke 39 years and he would uh, he died six months after he retired. And my mother never really had a nice house to live in. Now my mother's a senior citizen. And you know, I just Never thought my mama, she looked kind of funny being a senior citizen, you know, so. so. I just really hope that y'all can do something about it. Mr. Johnson, let me just ask you, your mother has a Section 8 voucher currently? Yes, sir. And how long has she had her voucher? 
Um, she's been having a voucher for like a few months. And has and she been looking? She's not found any place to live using that voucher at this point. Yes, sir. She found the place, but they haven't finished building it yet. Okay. Uh, and uh, she has this, her voucher through the Durham Housing Authority as well. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, well, again, I'm going to ask our staff to just talk to you afterwards to connect you with the Section Eight. Mm -hmm. folks over at the Durham Housing Authority and see if they can give you some advice. Thank you, sir. You're a real nice man. Thank you. Thank y'all. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Beamer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Thank you. Uh, and uh, here, here we have some more people who have signed up. I'm going to read their names and we'll go in order. David Crispell, Derek Holloway, Rita Anderson, Leslie Burrell, Rachel Stevens, Brianna Von Velzen. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? If so, please uh, come over here to the clerk's table and sign up. Okay, well, each person has three minutes. Again, please state your name and address. David Crispell. David Crispell, 114 Hillside Avenue, 27707. Mr. Mayor, members of staff and council, I recognize it is hard to feed the village of Durham nonprofits with a single piece of bread. However, I'm gonna advocate for another population that has not been mentioned tonight and has generally missed access to these funds that we're discussing. If historical trends hold true in the next year, we can expect roughly 600 individuals to return to the community from the state and carceral system. It does not include the jail and it does not include the federal system. Of those 600 people, roughly 200 will return without secure housing. Due to a kink in HUD uh, definition, they do not qualify as homeless, therefore losing many of the systems that could support them. Due to DHA kinks that are being worked out, as I understand, most of them do not qualify for subsidized housing in the community either. <coughs> Rapid rehousing is wonderful, and all of the organizations that have spoke here do wonderful things. But we have to have comprehensive solutions to housing in Durham. We have to recognize a spectrum of services that acknowledges emergency shelters, transitional facilities, and rapid rehousing as part of the same solution. I hope that the Department of Community Development and their future planning, as most of this funding has already been earmarked in particular directions, consider the full range of diversity needed to attack such a large problem. Thank you for your time tonight. Thank you very much, Mr. Chris Bell. And now we'll hear from Derek D. Holloway. Good evening. My name is Derek Duran Holloway. I live at uh, 516 Clarion Bridge Way. I'm the chair of Outstretched Hands Community Development Corporation. Uh, the founder of Effect Change Cooper uh, Cooperative Initiative in Durham uh, at 1020 Highway 70 East. Um, I would like to speak this evening in regard to a community that I also believe is being under-addressed or uh, completely overlooked, and that's the chronically homeless. Um, I agree that emergency service, uh, emergency shelters, um, transitional housing facilities are, are doing a a great job at their piece, but I believe that there is approach that the city of Durham needs to uh, seriously consider. And that's a model that's being proven across the country to effectively reduce homelessness and uh, at, a, at a tremendously cost-effective rate. And that's a model of housing first. Um, I have not heard it mentioned in the conversation of affordable housing uh, in regards to the chronically homeless community. These are people that are living in tents under bridges, behind buildings. My organization uh, interacts and engages this, these community, uh, these citizens of Durham on a weekly basis uh, with no funding. I looked at the presentation for the uh, workshop that was held last week. Uh, a little discouraged to see that we, though we qualify, there will be no uh, funding available. It will all be allocated towards rapid rehousing. Um, I believe that the approach um, of housing first addresses the immediate need 
uh, for Durham's um, chronically homeless community. Uh, what has been proven across the country is that the cost in emergency care services, rehab, incarceration, um, extended hospitalization is, is in large part due primarily to those that we uh, classify as chronically homeless in our point in time count. Um, and I think the last count that I saw, Durham says we only have 88 chronically homeless individuals. I know that not to be so. I engage these people every week. Um, but to the tune of $40,000 per person per year in expense of emergency care services, shelter, food, uh, rehab, extended hospitalizations and incarcerations, that's what it's costing us to leave these people on the street when the model of housing first reduces that cost and expense by half. Uh, it's being proven state to state to state um, that it is the most effective way to address our uh, homeless issue, and I believe it should be included in the conversation of affordable housing. Um, Ms. Friedman addressed the issue. Uh, are we going to speak from zero and upward in regards to addressing the issue of affordable housing in Durham? And I believe uh, we seriously need to consider that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Holloway. And we'll now hear from Rita Anderson. Hi, my name is Rita Anderson, and I live at 1101 South Street. For the last two weeks, I've been beating the pavement, trying to help a family find affordable housing. The city is failing our community. No man, woman, or especially child should be without decent living quarters. There needs to be more money put into programs that support homeless families until housing is found. There needs to be pro program. Excuse me. There need to be more programs to support families that have children over a certain age. Most of the programs that I went to and attended um, this past week um, on Knox Street um, would not accept Miss Vic and her family because her grandson is the age of 15 years old. So he's too old to be on the women and children's side, but he's not old enough to be on the men's side. So that has knocked her out from several programs that are here in the city. Um, we also need to have the AMI lowered for families who are on fixed incomes because we can't meet the qualifications of 60%. It needs to be lower than that. When you receive $700 odd dollars a month, and as I've been experiencing with Ms. Vic this week, there are rental companies that are charging an application fee of anywhere between $25 and $50 per person. And also some of the agencies are also um, requiring that you pay an administrative fee, which is $100, that none of that money is refundable. So someone that's on a fixed income cannot afford that. Um, Please put yourself, as you go home tonight, in their shoes. Consider yourself sleeping on someone's sofa. Is that home for you? The system looks good on paper, but walk in someone's shoes who is homeless and go through their daily process. I know that this city once a year does this thing where they go and they sleep out and portray being homeless, but don't take your good sleeping bags and don't take your pocket jackets and actually sleep with just a t-shirt on and a light jacket and really experience what homelessness is. Because what that does, that model that you all portray, is not real life for someone that can't find somewhere to stay. I have somewhere to stay. And to see my friend going through not knowing where her next night is gonna be, is really, really sad. To see that we going from place to place and the places that they would like to put her are not decent and you say you're, you're getting the homeless off the street, this is the best that you can offer, would you stay there? You need to put yourselves in their position and what we're seeing and what we're experiencing because this is not fun. I've stayed up many nights not knowing what my friend's next step is going to be. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. <laughs> Leslie Burrell. 
Leslie Burrell. Good evening. Good evening. Mayor, city, attorney, council, everyone. Um, my name is Leslie Burrell, and I live in Raleigh, North Carolina, which is next door. Um, I, I, am, I do have a voucher. Um, I'm a single mom. I'm a domestic violence survivor. And um, I'm in need for affordable housing. Um, I'm on a fixed income. My son has autism. He just recently finished high school at, um, in law. He's an AB student. And um, he recently got accepted to Central. Um, I recently lost my job. I work part time. I'm on the borderline of Bride Creek area. Um, it, but it's been very hard for me to find affordable housing um, due to his social skills and him living off the, the, the um, dorm, we can't afford that. So I was trying to relocate here to Raleigh, I mean to Durham, and it's been very hard to find decent housing. Um, I've been to ha the Durham Housing Authority multiple times. Um, um, they probably know my name. Um, I, I just, I'm trying to be a real good role model for my son. Um, I just really, I'm, I'm driving back and forth from Raleigh to Durham to get him to school. And that's been very hard for me to get him back and forth. And um, I, I really need your help. I really do. I wouldn't be here. Thank you very much. We appreciate you being here. We appreciate sharing the difficult situation that you're in. Uh, and we're, we're working on these things a lot. And um, some of them take a while. But thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Rachel Stevens. Hello, my name is Rachel Stevens. Um, I don't have a speech prepared or anything today. I'm actually just speaking from my heart. Um, I live at 3805 Chimney Ridge Place in Durham. There's a lot of people that came today that's in the same situation. You have smaller communities that uh, basically like certain age groups are reaching out to different foundations, making their own way to try to help the homeless situation, the in the community situations, but that's everybody pulling together as a village is supposed to do. But there's only so much that everybody can do. I'm happy that everybody that shared their story today, they can say that they're doing something to help the city. My situation that I wanted to speak on today was the Vermillion. So we have this project that we've been anticipating for almost a year. Very excited, great neighborhood. You're down the street from everything. You're actually away from the shooting. You're actually away from the sirens. You're actually in a good community. And it's something proud to be proud of, like, oh, I live by Hope Valley. I, I live in that area. I don't live by where this shooting just occurred or this shooting just occurred. So it's very exciting and to be able to watch your kids outside in, a, in, a, in that area and not have to worry about, oh, this is going to be a drive-by today because I live in a bad area. So people that I'm around that have got accepted into this vicinity, we're excited about it because of those reasons, because the city at this point and this time is dangerous. It's, it's almost ridiculous to wake up every morning and you're seeing on the news, something got, some, somebody got shot, something happened. So personally, I think that the communities, if you break these communities out or outward and put, okay, this affordable housing here, a lot of people won't have that much stress and that anger because that's what's going on. You're putting a lot of people in this community. It's not far from this community, and this is all happening. So that's why Ver Vermillion was very exciting because it's away from all those other communities where all this other bad stuff is happening. But we're on hold waiting to move in. People that have put down monies and we're waiting. We're just waiting. People picked out their, their place where they're going to stay. Me personally, I picked by the park so that I could see my three-year-old daughter play outside. 
I like the community. You have a, a, a great foundation. It's, it's a great start for something better and more for everybody. Those situations that everybody have went through, those affordable housing is what helps that. So me personally, help us out. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Stevens. Uh, we'll now hear from Brianna Von Velzen. As Ms. Von Velzen is coming up, can I ask, is there anyone else who would like to speak? If so, please sign up at the clerk's table. You have three minutes, Ms. Von Velzen. Hi, my name is Brianna Van Velzen. I live at 1605 Sedgefield Street, Apartment A. I'm coming before you today as a citizen, um, but I do work at Duke Chapel and I volunteered at Community Empowerment Fund with people who have housing vouchers, people who are experiencing homelessness, people with disabilities, and people who are returning citizens. And I want to say that the cut to the CDBG uh, and ESG funding would cripple the budgets for several of the shelters. Um, it's my belief that these shelters work in a justice model, uh, most of them or towards a justice model, and that they're actually helping citizens get back on their feet. Um, they're not uh, just like some charity case that's just throwing money out there. Um, these shelters provide case management, housing counseling, connections to resources, and they work with DHHS and other nonprofits uh, to make sure that resources aren't siloed. Um, and that's something I'm very concerned about as a citizen whose job is in those communities. Um, and I'm also concerned because I see people unable to connect their vouchers with housing. And so to me, it starts with you have to you have to connect um, from street homelessness all the way up to people who have 80% AMI when you talk about affordable housing. Because if you can't afford it, it's not affordable. Both my parents are on fixed incomes and are people with disabilities, and uh, they cannot afford to live by themselves in the city that they live in. Um, and that city is not nearly in the crisis that Durham is in right now. So I just wanted to express my concern as you consider the needs of the community and you consider funding that um, you reconsider the funding sources. Um, $200,000 isn't a lot in the city budget, in my opinion. Um, I think that expanding the budget would allow for a diversification of services. Um, I'm really excited Rapid Rehousing is getting more funding, but it would be great if the other funding didn't have to be sacrificed for program services. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Van Velsen. Is there anyone else that would like to speak on this item? Is there anyone else that would like to speak on this item? All right, I'm going to keep this public hearing open for now and uh, ask council members if they have any other questions or comments at this point. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Council Member Reese. Reginald, still with us? He is. How's it going? Oh, I'm doing fine. Excellent. Um, uh, I know I had some difficult questions for you when last we spoke, mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to make sure that everyone understood exactly what you were saying. I wasn't clear to me before I asked those questions, so I appreciate your direct answers. Um, I want to ask why the decision has been made to end the city's support for these organizations. Can you help us understand that? So as you, as you know uh, from previous, I've worked not to speak about specific organizations, and we've talked about that. Uh, let, me, let me rephrase my question. Is there some reason, can you help us understand the decision to stop the city's support for agencies and nonprofits that do the kind of work we've heard about tonight? Yes, as I shared earlier, we had talked working to be consistent with the strategy that we have adopted, as well as the uh, improving of our homelessness system. Now this, yeah, go ahead. So was it your understanding that when the city council passed our five-year affordable housing strategy that it meant we should not spend money doing these things? No. No, what, what I want why did you decide to stop spending money doing them? We work to, going back to the housing strategy as well as the findings from the report from the focus strategies. What we're working on doing is realigning our system to be able to better accommodate and expand the homelessness housing system. It's just not a one organization, but it's a system that services 
uh, those that are homeless and in, in, in need of housing. And so one of the things that's important to recognize, there is a difference between the individual level and the system level. And one of the things that has shown up is that our system has some deficiencies as well. That infects everyone. Was it your expectation then that there was insufficient funding to fix the system while supporting the base level needs of the homeless population in Durham? And is that why this decision was made? No, the decision was made to be, as I shared, to be consistent and try to uh, improve our system. As you, and if I'm sure that we will be doing a, a presentation before the city council on the focus strategy report, when we talk about the priorities that we have uh, and where the challenges are, there are challenges uh, and working for, working to service any particular organization is not going to be one of the top ones. As I've shared with you, there are some that are system-wide that we need to focus on with the resources that we do have. Is it your, is it your idea then that by focusing on the system-wide concerns, that the needs in the community that are being met by the, the agencies and nonprofits who came and talked to us tonight would be addressed? Uh, no, the purpose of this public hearing is to listen to the comments uh, as we put, begin the part process. This is part of a process. It's not final. It's not final until it's adopted by the uh, city council in May. And this is the beginning part of a process as we shared uh, with you in the beginning. We're required to have two public hearings uh, and this is the first one at the beginning of the process. So, I'm, I'm not quite done yet, I'm sorry. So is it your, is it your belief then that, um, so I asked, do you think that by addressing the system-wide concerns that you've talked about and that this report from focus strategies mm -hmm. will help us understand better? I asked if by doing that, would those, would taking those actions, whatever they are, address the community needs that are being met by the nonprofits that came and spoke tonight, and you said no. That's All correct. Right. Okay. So what would you have us do about those community problems? Is, what else do we need to do to help you understand that this is a priority as well? Because here's what I don't understand. And again, you're the person in front of me to talk to about this. And, yes. Okay. Um, the day that I voted in favor of this affordable housing strategy, if someone had told me that would mean cutting funding to meet the community needs that we've heard about tonight and that we've had many emails about, I would not have voted for the affordable housing strategy. So if that was what you thought you were being told by this council, I hope that you will come and talk to us about it again. Um, this was supposed to be additive, not taking away from current work to spend money doing other things. That was not my understanding. And if I gave you that impression by voting for this, I'm terribly sorry, but it was not my intention to do that. Um, and so I know we're, as you've said, this is the beginning of a process, but I also have to say that it seems like the decision, you've already made the decision. It seems like, as I've said, as you have told me, the city's not gonna spend money meeting these community needs anymore. And I just hope that you will listen to the folks that have talked tonight, mm -hmm. not so much out of their specific nonprofit concerns, but about the community needs that are obviously going to be unmet if we stop funding these services. And um, I, I won't belabor the point anymore. I know other folks want to talk, but um, I just hope that, that you will bring us into this conversation before additional decisions are made. And I appreciate your patience with me. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Reese, Council Member Freeman, and then Council Member Austin, and then Council Member Middleton. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you. I actually had a question. I wanted to hear more from Mr. Peter Gilbert, I want to say about the eviction crisis that we're facing and the housing shortage. Mr. Gilbert, can you come to this podium, please? And how nonprofits are not gonna be. Good evening. So you mentioned that you had, you had statistics and I just wanted to hear if you had a few that you could share specifically, because I wanna make sure that I'm well informed about. Um, I do, we are right so now. the big number um, is that of the 10 
counties in North Carolina with the highest population, of which Durham is one, Durham has far and away the highest eviction rate of any of the 10, county, 10 most populous counties in North Carolina, which I think is the fair comparison. There are other counties like Edgecombe County that have higher eviction rates than Durham, um, but uh, hope we're not striving to compare ourselves to the poorest counties in North Carolina. Uh, what that means is that there's about one eviction case filed per 28 residents in Durham uh, that compares to about one per 63 residents in Wake, so roughly twice the eviction rate that Wake County is experiencing. Um, I think that um, uh, some of the other numbers around that, of those, that's about 10,500 eviction cases filed every year, uh, more or less. It varies from month to month, and it varies a little bit from year to year. Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens as the city undergoes the RAD conversion, uh, if there's an increase or, or, or increased displacements as a result of that. Um, only about 400, from what I understand from Director Scott, only about 440 of those eviction cases each year are DHA evictions uh, right now. So the vast majority of the, of the displacements, displacements and the homelessness that's resulting from that is coming from private landlord-tenant evictions. Um, even the, the very large uh, nonprofit housing providers like DCLT and others make up only a tiny fraction of the units that are rented to low-income and low-wealth people uh, in Durham. Um, even if you count the vouchers, that's still only um, a, a small percentage of the overall need for affordable housing in Durham. Um, of those roughly 10,000 a year, uh, the numbers that I have from the Sheriff's Department is it looks like about a third of those, um, maybe a little more than a third, uh, result in the writ of possession actually being issued. So that's at the end of the process. Um, studies from other jurisdictions make it pretty clear that uh, the landlord wins the vast majority of the time. I can tell you, you know, you don't have to sit through many sessions of small claims or district court to know that. Um, the landlord wins the vast majority of the time. The landlord is much more likely to be represented by a lawyer. In Durham right now, uh, unless you're represented by me or one person we recently hired at Legal Aid, thanks to a grant from the Bar Association, tenants don't have lawyers. So we're talking about um, eight to 900 eviction cases a month, and I can't do that many. Um, uh, so I, I don't know what other numbers would help Councilperson Freeman, but. So specifically, I, I want to say that the, the evictions that you're talking about are specifically like going through the court process. Do, are there, is there anywhere that you can find numbers of folks who haven't even gone through the court process? That's much harder uh, to document. Um, in North Carolina, it is illegal to evict someone without going through the court process, but there are many, many tenants. I'm sorry, can you move. say that one more time in the mic? I didn't hear I'm it. sorry. In North Carolina, it is illegal to evict someone through what is called self-help eviction. It does happen, and I do those cases as well, where a landlord will change the locks or turn off the heat or try to force somebody out without going through the court process. That's illegal, um, and it, for the most part, doesn't happen. Where we see that happening is on the, uh, the kind of borderline housing, places that claim to be hotels but really aren't, in my opinion. Um, uh, 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 people who rent to the really the, the people on the fringes of society the most um, uh, vulnerable populations, rent and boarding houses. Many times the owners of those type of facilities will, will call the Durham Police Department to have people trespassed, claiming that there's no landlord-tenant relationship and it's not an eviction, so they don't have to use the courts. Um, when I hear about those and fight those, I generally win. Um, the, the numbers of how many people leave when they get a late notice and they know they're not gonna be able to pay it and they know they're not eligible for DSS assistance are hard to know. I will tell you that DSS, as part of our eviction diversion program, has told us that they're getting, I think the numbers, and I don't have them in front of me, are, are several hundred, three to 400 people a month are coming to DSS. Um, uh, uh, it may be different than that. Actually, uh, Mr. I know I emailed uh, some information to you earlier, Mr. Bonfeld, so if you can correct me, I, I 45 don't. to 50. Is What's that? I think it says 45 to 50 here. No, 45 to 50 is the number of cases that are coming from DSS to me each month, and those are people who are in the court process. The larger number is the number of people who are going to DSS each month for emergency rental assistance. Uh, most of them are not receiving that emergency rental assistance because uh, there's a lot of restrictions on the funding. But um, People are afraid of the consequences of having an eviction judgment on your record, because once you have an eviction judgment on your record, it is much, much harder, especially in this market, to find somewhere else to move, whether you have a voucher or not. 
And so a lot of people are moving before they ever get the court papers or that process is ever initiated. How, uh, how many that is, uh, I don't have a good way to ask. Thank you, I appreciate that. And the, the, there was another gentleman I want to say. Thank you, Mr. Gilbert. And the gentleman who was talking about the folks that are re-entering and the, I was just trying to find out more Dave, about the organization. David Christel. David Christel. I, I was trying to find out. I didn't catch the name of the organization or the... Um, I'm the director of Jubilee Home and a member of the local reentry council. The local... I'm sorry. Local reentry council with CJRC. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, council Member Austin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Johnson, forgive me if you mentioned this, but I just wanted to clarify. Will the Homeless Service Services Advisory Committee have another opportunity to discuss this issue yes it will and when is that i would say in the they're working on it now there are subcommittees of the homeless services advisory committee that are actually working now what we're hoping to do uh and what they're hoping to do is to be able to uh present a more comprehensive um recommendation uh along with the report to the city council uh sometime in the spring i would say probably about february uh because we want to uh cons have it in concert with our, our budget process, but they are actually working now. They received the report and committees are re reviewing it now. Thank you. Okay. Council Member Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I wanna firstly just make a statement, I think for the sake of transparency. Um, before being elected to the council, I was on the board of directors of the Interfaith Hospitality Network, which is a precursor organization for families moving forward. I want to let that be known. Um, if you look at the, uh, if you tour the Genesis home, there's a room there uh, that's um, furnished and on the plaque outside, the, the not-for-profit that I lead now is one of the organizations that furnished that room. So I just want to be very clear about my vestedness uh, in, this, um, in this debate, in this discussion, but for the sake of transparency. If I thought for one minute that our staff were in any deliberate way uh, targeting uh, organizations that I feel a great deal of affinity for, um, then I'd be a big problem up here on this podium uh, for them. Uh, I want to be very clear to our fellow citizens about something, at least as I see this discussion. Um, you didn't vote for an Office of Community Development. You voted for us. So the buck stops with us. Um, oftentimes, staffs, and, and I know the staff works very hard, um, they're not wayward, they're not at war uh, with homeless services. Oftentimes, we politicians will say we want an end, and then we'll leave it to bureaucrats to kind of read the tea leaves as to what we want and how we want it interpreted. Here's what we say to staffs oftentimes. Here's a certain amount of money. Uh, be efficient, uh, focus on systems. Um, we, don't, we didn't direct the staff to focus on particular organizations. Um, so any, any concern, you're right to, to email us. I don't in any way feel constrained by uh, any decisions or preliminary findings that the staff makes because ultimately it will be our decision. Um, I think our staff uh, was being motivated uh, by their best interpretation uh, of what, it, because if you think about affordable housing during this campaign, you know, depending upon how you define affordable housing and what was the best outcome, we talked about comprehensive affordable housing plans. We talked about jobs being important as well. Uh, this is a new council. Uh, we may very well need to, to clarify and re-clarify for staff what our goals are and what our ends are. But I will say this, um, if this council, and I hope it does, uh, if this council uh, directs this staff to uh, restore funding or keep funding levels at what it is, and I'll, I'll self-identify, I hope we will, it is not because we are correcting a wayward or incompetent or insensitive staff. I want you to interpret it as us re-clarifying what our goals are and what our ends are as the people you elected. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. I have some comments I'd like to make as well. Um, just first of all, when I think about the, the one of the things about this discussion, and, and I really appreciate all the people that have come out to speak, 
uh, and particularly those that have come out to speak to tell their own individual story and, and the situations that you have been faced with. And what I think this discussion has again revealed to us is we know anyway, but it's always good to have a fresh reminder, even if it's an unhappy reminder, is a situation that we face in Durham around affordability uh, of housing. We heard from a lot of different people and we heard a lot of different perspectives. One of the things we heard is that people who, even though they have a Section 8 voucher, which will pay most of their rent, they're still unable to find a place in Durham to use that voucher. And the city, uh, you all should know that last year the city put roughly $250,000 of support to the Durham Housing Authority so the Durham Housing Authority could improve its administration of the voucher system and we could assist with that. In addition to which, uh, we heard from someone tonight uh, from um, Community Empowerment Fund, Community Empowerment Fund and other organizations have pulled together landlords uh, in, the, in the mayor's uh, round table uh, to talk to landlords about accepting vouchers and what would be the, what are the barriers that they have towards accepting vouchers. So the city, nonprofit organizations and the Durham Housing Authority are working together to try to get people to take Section 8 vouchers but we can't control what landlords will do. There's also another effort being led on, by, by the nonprofits to uh, have a risk mitigation fund for landlords. So that if you take a Section 8 voucher and you have some concern about taking a Section 8 voucher because you might have some concern about who has carrying that voucher, if there's anything that happens to your uh, apartment and that person leaves, there's a risk mitigation fund that would pay the landlord back for um, up to, I believe, the current number is about $1,000 worth of any repairs that happen. I see 2,000. So the risk mitigation fund, the work with landlords and the mayor's roundtable, the city's funding of the voucher program, the Durham Housing Authority's uh, reworking its own Section 8 voucher program, there's a ton of good work going on, but there's still it's still up to the landlords to do it. We're trying our best, but I want you all to know that, the, uh, that I want you all to know about those programs Vermilion, I want to mention something about Vermilion. So the Vermilion was the recipient of a 9% of a low-income housing tax credit, 60 units of affordable housing, including six units, which would be for people uh, at 30% of the area median income or less, the other at 60% of the area median income or less. Vermilion um, has run into financial trouble. The city, out of your city tax dollars, uh, has already put in approximately $200,000 into Vermillion to try to get them over the hump on their construction. But this is a private developer, and they uh, are still uh, in, in the financial situation where they're trying to get over the hump and get those built. So that's not anything that the city controls. We have supported them. We have already subsidized them, and we hope that they will be able to get over the hump in terms of get those units open. I very much sympathize with the person who was here talking about that, and and very hopeful that those units will come will come online. Let me also mention uh, a housing first philosophy. For those of those folks who were involved in our homelessness uh, here in Durham, you will know already that that do this work that that is our philosophy in Durham. That the gentleman talked about a housing first philosophy. That is our philosophy. That's the philosophy of our continuum of care. That you cannot solve addiction problems, mental health problems, and other problems if someone does not have a roof over their head. That is our philosophy. And it is the philosophy of our nonprofits that work on this, and I appreciate your, your bringing that up. I want to mention the penny for housing. Just to be clear, because we've gotten a lot of emails for this, the penny for housing has added $2.75 million, not $5.5 million, to our, house, our affordable housing fund. Still a substantial amount of money, but just wanted to clarify that. Uh, on the, we, I want to just uh, let the, the members of the, uh, the, the public know who are interested in the eviction issue and I want to thank Mr. Gilbert uh, for bringing that to our attention tonight. Uh, that uh, council, uh, that Mayor Pro Tem Johnson has been uh, working with us and with the city manager. And we're going to have a presentation on the eviction work in at a work session uh, at the, in sometime early this year. And that will include the people that are working on the eviction diversion program. And the council will hear a report on that program and uh, talk about how that's going and how we can continue that work. Uh, and then finally, uh, the returning citizens uh, that Mr. Crispell was mentioning, uh, the, the local reentry council is working on how to house approximately 200 people per year who are coming back to Durham from uh, 
state prisons. And uh, this is very difficult work. As you know, there are lots of barriers to the people who are coming back, and it's very important that these people be housed. The connection between that work and our, and our, and our affordable housing work in general needs to be tighter. And there's a lot of good work that's going on about that. Uh, the two, the, both the Reentry Council and the, the affordable housing folks are talking. Uh, right now, those systems are pretty much separate, but this is, this is very important work. So I'm trying to say all these things just to say it's a big problem, it's multifaceted, and we are doing, we being the city, all the good folks in Reginald's department, and other people throughout the city are doing a tremendous amount of work on this, as are our great nonprofits. And I appreciate hearing from UMD, Families Moving Forward Care, Outstretched Hands, which was my first, first hearing about Outstretched Hands. I was very glad to hear that. Mr. Tosh, there's a lot of great work being done, and this has got to be our community's mission to make this right. Uh, let me just say on the, I think that, uh, I, I think that, um, we have got to get, uh, we, we, we need to fund these critical, uh, the critical work that's being done in these shelters. Exactly which pot of funds that it comes from is on us. And I think that what the, what the Community Development Department is trying to do in terms of, they have a consultant in to try to rationalize the system and figure out what we ought to be doing and adding to the, to the coordinated intake. I hear all that, I'm anxious to I uh, hope that we, we can do a much better job of that, but we also need to figure out, and my, count, my colleagues have already mentioned this, it's on us to figure out how to fund this, this crucial shelter work. Not individual organizations. We have fair RFP processes that people can apply for so that we're not funding particular organizations. Organizations have to apply through the process, but that these categories of funding are critically important, and I know that we'll be discussing this more in the new year. Um, Okay, uh, anything else before we uh, close this public hearing and the matters back before the council? Council Member Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just had um, one last question for um, Reginald Johnson. I meant Mayor Pro Tem Johnson, pardon <laughs> me. Um, could you give us a sense of the timeline for this entire process and at what point um, we'll be asked to make decisions about the budget and the funding? The way I'll respond is that we have two processes. So I'm going to pursue the federal process first. Mm -hmm. And so the beginning of the process is that we uh, have a needs public hearing, as we are doing now. We are required to have two. And the department administratively opens up the application process. Uh, that's the way the, the uh, work uh, done, is done. The application process is open through uh, February, I think it's the end of February, the first of February. Then the Citizens Advisory Committee uh, reviews uh, the applications, uh, the City Manager's Office reviews the applications in, the, in addition to the Community Development staff. And then we look at the uh, final recommendations that we have to put on federal, I mean on public review um, by the end of April uh, because the uh, the uh, annual action plan, which has to be heard by this council after a second public hearing, has to be submitted by May the 15th. So that's the federal process. Okay. Then I will share with you the next process is, is the process that we have for the allocation of general fund dollars, which is part of our budget process. Can, I, can, we, can we stick to the federal process for just a minute? So. So if at some point this council were to ask for some of the funding that's currently being allocated in different ways to be reallocated, at what point would that happen? And would agencies be applying without knowing whether or not funding would be available if the applications are only open to the end of February? So one of the things that we would have to do, this is part of a needs public hearing that we receive comments. And one of the things that we are available to do is that we can relook at the process that has opened thus far. It just opened. So that's number that's mm -hmm. number one. Then we will have a second public hearing uh, as we come before the council. And the council, in the end, has to approve all of the final decisions. Mm -hmm. 
and that uh, goes to the annual action plan. And we've had previous councils that have made different uh, allocation decisions uh, at that juncture. Uh, there is some concern and risk, which at the appropriate time I will share at that time, but that is the purview of the city council to be able to make those, those final decisions. Okay, is thank you. My, my I guess I'm, my concern is that if it appears that there's no funding, that people won't apply for funding. And we would have to, on the back end, allocate that funding, but because it hadn't been there during the application process, no one would have known to ask for it. Mm -hmm. So is there a way to solve that issue? Yeah, I think there is. I think we can go back and look at the application process. Okay. That'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, and, I, and I would also share that, you know, on behalf of the Community Development Department, the recommendation will, that will come to you in total will have more money for funding for the homeless housing system than what we have now. You're just seeing part of it now because it's a federal process. Right. I understand. Thank you. Um, could, is there a... Never mind, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll follow up with you later, okay, about specifics about that. Thank you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Any uh, council members, any other questions, comments? Okay. Um, I think that uh, I want to appreciate everyone who came out for the public hearing. I, I know that the Community Development Department uh, got a good sense of the, uh, of the direction that the council is interested in, and much appreciate your, uh, you all being here, and I'm going to declare this public hearing closed. Thank you very much. All we were doing today was receiving comments. No decision is to be made. Thank you very much. And now we'll move to item 15, the Venable Center landmark designation. Um, and this is to conduct a public hearing to receive comments on the des designation Mr. and to Mayor. take certain options. Excuse me, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the council does have to vote to receive the public comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Reginald. Do I hear a motion to receive the public comments? I'll move to receive the public comments. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Uh, Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. Thank you. It passed the six to zero. Thank you very much, and thank you for that correction, Reginald. And now we'll move to item 15, the Venable Center landmark designation. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council, Pat Young with the planning department. Um, I'm going to turn the mic over to Ms. Carla Rosenberg of our staff to introduce the item, but I did want to quickly um, certify for the record that all public hearing items before you tonight have been advertised in accordance with the requirements of law and there are affidavits to that effect on file with the planning department. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Young. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Carla Rosenberg with the planning department. Um, this is case LD 170001. Um, which is a request um, for landmark designation for land associated with the Venable Center. Uh, the buildings associated with the Venable Center are currently landmarked. Originally, both the buildings and the land were landmarked. The land contained a large parking lot, and then last year, the landmark status was removed for the purpose of subdividing the property into two parcels so that one of those parcels, the parking lot, could be redeveloped in the future. Ms. Ms. Rosenberg, can you excuse me one minute? I'm sorry. Could you please shut the door and uh, you move outside if you'd like to talk and keep the door shut? Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. I'm sorry, Ms. Rosenberg. Go ahead. Sure. So um, once the property was subdivided, um, the uh, <coughs> landmark designation was removed from those parcels, the present proposal is to redesignate the parcel that contains the buildings. Um, so this property is located just south of downtown at the corner of South Roxborough Street and East Pettigrew Street. Um, it is not currently undergoing renovations. It is individually listed on the National Register of Historic Places and staff has found the property be, to be associated with events that have made a significant contribution to the broad patterns of local, regional, regional or national history, and it has yielded or may be likely to yield information important to Durham's history. Those are the criteria that it must meet um, to be landmarked. Um, there's a table in the staff report that shows property tax assessments. Uh, the tax value of the land is significantly lower than the tax value of the buildings. And so the additional yearly loss of revenue 
should the land be designated would be 3,287 for the city, 4,363 for the county, and a total of $7,650 per year. Um, the Historic Preservation Commission gave its recommendation for landmark uh, 50 on August 5th, 2017, and the State Historic Preservation Office issued a letter of recommendation on August 21st, 2017. Um, so I am here to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Ms. Rosenberg. Uh, you've heard the staff report. I'm going to declare the public hearing open, and I'm first going to ask if there are any comments or questions by members of the council. I, so. I have a few. If no one else does, is anyone else at this point? Um, is the separation of a single parcel into two parcels, is that is what is referred to in the staff report as a recombination? Yes. Okay. Yes. It was a little confusing. Yeah. All right. And I was unclear about what the new boundaries are. Um, is the is there land inside the parcel that we would be redesignating that is not building, that is a, a courtyard or a, you know, a flat piece, a piece of land? The sort of empty areas, um, there are two to note. Uh, one is in front of uh, the oldest building on the site, which is at the corner of Roxborough and Pettigrew, it's a triangular piece shape of land. Um, and then there's also a small parking lot in front of the uh, annex building. And that parking lot would be included in the redesignation? Correct, it's, yes. Okay, so the, okay. Okay, those are my questions, thank you very much. Thank you. Let's see if we have, uh, members of the public to speak on this. I believe we have one. Um, Charlie Yokely. Man, you did good with my terrible handwriting. I, I'm impressed. Uh, my name is Charlie Yokely, 2905 Meridian Parkway. Um, I'm with the McAdams Company representing the property owner um, in this request. Essentially, what happened was the property owner did not intend to remove the land around the building from landmark designation. While the landmark repeal was going on for the larger parking lot, what is now parcel two, the recombination was done, and at about the same time, the repeal of the landmark designation was also approved. And it was an, an honest mistake that that land was removed from landmark designation. So we're here today to ask that that, be, that land be put back, designated as a landmark, to encourage future preservation and the historic nature of that lot. Thank you, Mr. Yokely. Yes, sir. Is there anyone else that would like to speak on this item? Anyone else that would like to be heard? Anyone from the council have any more questions? Mm -hmm. Just a clarifying question. I, I'm, Ms. Rosenberg? Ms. Rosenberg. So I just want to be, make sure I'm clear. The parking lot behind the Venable building is not what we're talking about. It's just that area within, like, the courtyard between the two properties. Um, it's specifically the um, two areas that are fronting Roxborough Street. Okay. Um, so if you look that at the... All. That was all. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Um, is there anyone else that wish to speak on this item? Uh, if not, then let the record reflect that no one else is requested to speak on this item, and I now declare the public hearing to be closed, and the matter is back before the council. Uh, we are asked here to receive comments and also to adopt, adopt an ordinance designating the land associated with Venable Center as a local historic landmark. I'd, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to move that we accept the adoption of the local historic landmark. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Uh, Madam Clerk, could you please open the vote? Close the vote. It passes six to zero. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Ms. Rosenberg. And now we'll move to item 16, zoning map change, map change for 5275 North Roxborough Street. Mm -hmm. 
<clears throat> Good evening, I'm Jamie Sonyak with the planning department. There is a request for a zoning map change uh, which has been received for a 1.31 acre property located at 5275 North Roxborough Street. <clears throat> the applicant requests to change the designation from commercial neighborhood to commercial general with a development plan. The site is located within the Eno, within the Eno River uh, Basin Overlay District. The development plan commits to a maximum of 10,000 square feet of floor area for all uses permitted within the CG zone. The site is currently designated commercial on the future land use map, which is consistent with the rezoning request. Um, key commitments as shown on the associated development plan include site access points, building and parking envelopes, tree coverage locations, project, project boundary buffers, as well as tax commitments for a um, bus pullout shelter along the west side of North Roxborough Street, an additional right of way along the street's frontage for the funded TIP project, uh, U5516. The Planning Commission recommended approval 12-0 at their October 10th, 2017 meeting. Staff determines that these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and the applicable policies and ordinances. Two motions are required to approve this item. The first motion is to adopt a consistency statement, um, which is required by uh, GS-160A-383. And then the second motion would be to um, adopt a zoning ordinance change. I'll be happy to answer questions that you might have. Thank you, Ms. Sunyak. You have heard the uh, report of staff, and I'm now going to declare this public hearing open. Uh, first, I will ask if there are any questions or comments by council members. Just mm -hmm. so I, because I was on the planning commission when this case came before us, I, I just <coughs> want to acknowledge that I approved or I agreed to the to the zoning changes based on the fact that there's not really anything in place that would prevent us from approving it. And I want to acknowledge that this uh, zoning case actually could put another business out of, or another commercial business out of business because it's a newer car wash across from an older car wash. And I just, I just want to make sure that we're, we're, we're looking at ways to address this and going forward, acknowledging that right now we might not have that. Thank you, Ms. Freeman. Thank you. Can I uh, respond quickly? Yes. Jamie Sanyak with the planning department. Um, the development plan, just so it's clear, does not specifically identify a car wash. Um, the, the developer did. The developer did, um, that is true. The development plan specifically commits to a maximum of 10,000 square feet in floor area. Um, but with, with that said, there was a discussion during the planning commission hearing by the applicant that the person who purchased the property may intend on building a car wash, but it is not limited. Um, if that falls through, it would be open to uh, any other uses that are permitted within that zone. Thank you, Ms. Sunyak. Uh, I have here, I believe, two people who have signed up to speak on this, Dale Reynolds and Tim Sievers. And is there anyone else who would like to speak? So anyone else, and are you all both proponents? You are, okay. Um, I'm going to uh, ask that you all each hold your comments to three minutes, and uh, we'll hear first. Mr. Sievers, would you like to go first? Great. Please state your name and address. Tim Sievers, Horvath Associates, 16 Consultant Place, Durham, North Carolina. Thank you, Mayor Shul, Jamie, for your staff report. And thank you, uh, council members. Uh, a quick summary of the site, and I promise I will stay under th the three minutes. Um, the summary is uh, the site is about 1.1 acres. It is the existing vacant Burger King site. Um, there is a currently funded NCDOT project that will actually divide uh, Roxborough Road. There will be a median in this road. Um, so that will, in itself, separate some of the uses. Yes, our intended use is a car wash, but that is, is not being committed to a car wash to, uh, for the ability of keeping that open for future development. Uh, there is a 10,000 square foot maximum building area, which will help restrict development in the future just because of the size of the site. 
Uh, prior to the Planning Commission meeting, we did mail out uh, notices to the neighbors and neighborhood organizations. Heard a little bit of feedback. They were all um, opponents. They were all proponents, excuse me, proponents of the site. Uh, most of them were actually excited about seeing the uh, vacant Burger King redeveloped. Um, as I said, the intended development is a car wash. Uh, a few comments on the development plan. Again, 10,000 square foot maximum building area. We're doing a 70% maximum impervious area, building design commitments, and some additional right-of-way dedication, which will provide a right-of-way for the current NCDOT project. Uh, again, um, Dale Reynolds will be speaking. He is the owner and developer of the site and owner of Carolina Pride and Autorific Car Washes in the area. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sivers. I'm sorry I got your name wrong. I should know that by now. Mr. Reynolds, you have three minutes. Good evening, Mayor and Council members. My name is Dale Reynolds. I live at 105 Abbott Short Court. Appreciate the opportunity to be before you tonight. Uh, the property in question, uh, we think we can enhance the community with a redevelopment of that property is the old Burger King site that's been closed down for many years. Uh, it would be a good opportunity for us to develop a new facility there that would be uh, a good car wash that would be one of the most efficient in water conservation there are. So all the car washes that we own and operate are certified water conservation facilities, and ours is the only industry that has that in the state of North Carolina. Um, Ms. Friedman, you mentioned about putting another car wash out of business. That is not our intent at all. The type of wash that we're proposing to build is an express wash. The wash that's across the street from that is a self-serve car wash where you do it yourself. The other one is a full-serve car wash where they do all those services for the customer. We will be a different type of car wash, not in that those competing types of businesses. So it's not our intention to put anybody out of business, but to provide a different service that's out there. Additionally to that, we will employ many people on different parts of the economic spectrum from lower income to middle income jobs as well. So our full uh, employment pay will be at $11 an hour. We also offer benefits and all to employees that those other car washes do not offer to theirs as well. So we're gonna do many things that we think will be helpful as well. Uh, the other thing we're looking at also is to, if able, working with some of the local uh, agencies and organizations, is employ some people on uh, special needs as well. So we do that with some of our other businesses and all as well. Uh, so if we can do that, and that helps the community also. So that's our plan is to put something nice and different that's in the community. And if you look at our other sites that we have in the community currently, we keep them maintained well. Um, we have somebody at all of them constantly with video. So we do a lot of things to keep them safe and attractive and a uh, facility that people would want to visit. I'd be glad to answer any questions that you might. Thank you, Mr. Reynolds. Appreciate it. Thank you. Is there anyone else that wishes to speak on this item? I have two more questions. Anyone else in the public that wishes to speak on this item? If not, uh, any questions or comments from council members? Council Member Freeman? Uh, just, just coming back to your comments. Um, Mr. Mr. Reynolds or Mr. Sivers? Mr. Reynolds, thank you. You mentioned there would be jobs. Um, yeah. I would love to know how many, if you do know already. Yeah, right now we're anticipating be eight positions there. And, and then you mentioned that it was $11 an hour. Yes, our full-time uh, employees are starting at 11 an hour. And is that with benefits? Yes. Wow, great. Thank yes, you. Yes, we offer. I, I, I just wanted to um, dig into that a little bit deeper. And then you mentioned using some uh, services for folks with disabilities as well. Yes, I currently employ some people on special needs. Um, I'm a former board member of the Autism Society in North Carolina also. Okay. And so we try. And currently, I have some people on the spectrum employed with us as well in other capacities. Thank you. I wish a lot more of the developers could be more transparent. In that. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reynolds. Sure. Anyone else in the public wish to speak on this item? If no one else wishes to speak, well, I should ask council members, anyone else? If no one else in the public wishes to speak on this item, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed and the matter is back before the council. Uh, we need to make two motions here. One is to adopt the consistency statement. The second is to adopt an ordinance amending the unified development ordinance. Do I have a motion to adopt the consistency statement? So moved, Mr. Mayor. It's been second. moved and properly seconded. Please, uh, uh, Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. It passes six to zero. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. Uh, and now do I hear a motion to adopt an ordinance amending the UDO? I move. Second. Second. It's been moved and properly seconded. Madam Clerk, would you please open the vote?
close the vote. I'm sorry, did I say that? <laughs> Thank, passes. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Sorry for my lack of uh, articulate statement there. Uh, and now we'll move on to item 17, consolidated annexation for Sagewood and Nichols Farm. Uh, this is also a public hearing item. Thank you, Jacob Wiggins with the Planning Department. Um, requests for utility extension agreements, voluntary annexation, and initial zoning map have been um, received from Highland Falls Raleigh LLC for two contiguous parcels totaling approximately 93 acres um, located along Dyke Nichols Road. Um, if approved, this annexation will become effective on December 31st, 2017. Um, the applicant has requested an initial zoning designation of residential role, um, which is an exact translation of the existing county zoning designation. Um, please note that if this request is approved, it will create some new donut holes. Um, this is primarily a result of staff's request that the applicant include the right of way for Dyke Nichols Road into this um, annexation petition, as Dyke Nichols Road is the only primary public road access for these. Um, the applicant did reach out to at least one uh, property owner in the what would be the theoretical donut hole, um, and it's our understanding that, that that property owner has no interest in annexation at this time. Um, the Public Works and Water Management Departments uh, performed the utility impact analysis, which determined that the city water and sewer mains have capacity for this project, and the Budget and Management Services also performed the physical analysis, which determined that the request will likely be revenue positive at build-outs. Um, staff determines um, overall that these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Um, please note that there will be three motions to approve this item that may differ slightly from what's in your report. Um, it's staff understanding that we're gonna try to um, consolidate slightly. So the first motion would be a motion to approve the annexation ordinance and the utility extension agreement. <coughs> the second motion would be to adopt a consistency statement as required by law. And the third ordinance, or I'm sorry, the third motion would be to adopt a zoning ordinance. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that the council may have at this time. Thank you. You all have heard the staff report. I'm going to declare this public hearing open, and I'm going to ask if there are any co comments or questions by members of the council. I have a question, Mr. Mayor. M council Member Middleton. Thank you, sir. Attachment four, we, we would be actually creating donut holes through mm -hmm. this? Correct. Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> all right. I, I may come back and revisit, but thank you. Yeah, again, I would say, you know, t technically that is correct, but if you look at the context, it's a little bit different scenario than some of the typical donut holes that we've just recently cleaned up. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'd love to hear the difference. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Sure, yeah, um, if I may. So the primary um, creator of this donut hole is the right-of-way for Doc Nichols Road that we've asked the applicant to include. Um, this helps alleviate situations. Um, take the, the fire station on Highway 98 as an example. So that's actually in the county's jurisdiction. So if there's an accident in front of that fire station, the city PD is not, or fire station is not the first station that would receive that call. It actually go to a volunteer fire department in the county. Um, so let's say this annexation were to be approved and we didn't annex the Doc Nichols right of way and that an accident happens at the intersection to these new residential subdivisions, they, even though the subdivision itself may be in the city, since the right of way is in, in the county, at that point, it can't be served by city PD. It can't be served by city fire. So it increases response times to those emergency situations. So to help in that regard, we asked the applicant to please include the Doc Nichols Road right of way, which as you notice on the maps, it does leave some little strips of properties that will not be in the city at this time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Other council members, questions or comments? I had one. Um, I, in, as I read this, uh, excluding the impact fees, which for capital expenditures, but in terms of operating, city expenses are exceeding city revenues uh, with the annexation and the utility extension. Is that, am I reading that right, Jacob? Um, yes, sir, Mayor. So at build-out, um, if you take the two cases in combination at build-out, including impact fee revenues, it'll be slightly revenue positive. Um, there are some large expenditures up front. 
Um, if you want to reference attachment eight in your packet, it has the full um, financial impact analysis. And you'll see in years after build out, when the city doesn't have those expenditures, there's just a lot more revenue being generated. Absolutely. And, you know, this is, I hear you. Um, I have very, is, there, is it attachment eight you mean, really? No, it's, it's attachment. Um, I think you mean um, nine. So attachment eight is the utility, I'm sorry, the cost benefit analysis that breaks down the projected revenues in future years. Right, it's, I'm sorry, Enumeration it's, that, it's that funny numbering thing we do, got it. Um, you know, I just, it, it's very unusual to see, I, I don't remember uh, us approving an, a rezoning and annexation that wasn't revenue positive for the city at build out. Am I wrong? Um, it, it is rare. Um, sometimes you'll see it not be rev revenue positive at build out if it's a not for profit, not for profit organization. Mm -hmm. <coughs> you said if you take the combination of these two, it it does appear to be revenue positive at build out. Um, mm -hmm. It is close, um, but looking at future years, I think this is where the city, based on the projections we have thus far, is where the city would really see the benefit. But I, I would say, based on my experience in the last couple of years, this one is closer than normal for a mm -hmm. more profit, uh, more private development. Right, and, but, I, but I do see what you're saying about future years. Okay, um, any other questions at this point by members of the council or comments? Uh, if not, uh, we, have had, we have one person who has uh, signed up to speak, I believe, on this, and that's Charlie Yokely again, Mr. Yokely. Yes, sir. Uh, Charlie Yokely, 2905 Meridian Parkway in Durham uh, with the McAdams Company. Uh, we're the consultant for the subdivision and the annexation and... I think Jacob covered it pretty well. So uh, I'm here, the engineers here, and the uh, property owners here. Um, so we're really just available for any questions that you guys might have. Any questions? Any questions? I, I just had a Council Member Freeman. Uh, the donut hole or the property, have we spoken to the property owner at all? I would really like to feel um, a lot more confident in this. Sure, Councilman Freeman. Um, I'll defer to the applicant. I do know that they have um, spoken with at least one adjacent property owner. And I can address that. Uh, Charlie Oakley again. If you're looking at the two properties that are subject to the annexation, there's that piece in between them. That is the property owner we spoke to. It actually came up at the neighborhood meeting mm -hmm. that we had last year when this project got started. And uh, he was emphatic at that time that he was not willing to have his property annexed into the city. Uh, the issue with the, the donut hole question came up uh, during the annexation review. It was a comment from staff. So we reached out to that property owner again. I, I sent him an email and I have, if necessary, I have a printed copy of that email, I believe, I, and I know I sent it to staff. Um, and he again said that he was not interested in having his property annexed into the city. Thank you very much. sir. Any other questions or comments by members of the council? If not, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed and the matter is back before the council. Uh, we have been advised that uh, we can take the two first two items as a single motion to adopt ordinances annexing Sagewood and Nichols Farm and to authorize the city manager to enter utility extension agreements. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Uh, Madam Clerk, would you please open the vote? Close the vote. It passes six to zero. Thank you very much. Mr. Mayor, I'll move the consistency statement. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. We adopt the consistency statement. Uh, oh, please, uh, Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Close the vote. <laughs> it passes six to zero. Mr. Mayor, I'll move the zoning ordinance. That we adopt the zoning ordinance. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Uh, is there, is there a second? Thank you. It's been moved and seconded to adopt the ordinance amendment of the UDO. Uh, Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Close the vote. I killed it that time. <laughs> Six to zero. Thank you very much. 
Um, and now, um, I'm so sorry that I missed item two. We're going to go back to that. Let's just call it a rookie mistake, but we're going to go to item 23 now, the resolution supporting the temporary protective status program, and then we're going to come back to item two. Uh, Council, uh, Mayor Pro Tem uh, Johnson, would you like to introduce uh, the, the, uh, the item, item 23? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so this is a resolution supporting the Temporary Protected Status Program, and I'll just go ahead and read it into the record. Um, whereas the U.S. Department of Homeland Security may grant temporary protected status, including employment authorization and protection from deportation to immigrants in the United States who are unable to return safely to their home countries because of violence, natural disaster, or other extraordinary conditions, and whereas an estimated 322, I'm sorry, 320,000 people from 10 designated countries, primarily in Central America, hold temporary protected status. And whereas on November 6, 2017, the Department of Homeland Security effect, announced that it will not renew temporary protected status for Nicaraguan nationals effective January 5, 2019. And whereas on November 20, 2017, the Department of Homeland Security announced that it will not renew temporary protected status for Haitian nationals, effective July 22, 2019. And whereas the Department of Homeland Security is studying whether to end protections for Hondurans and Salvadorans. And whereas the Center for American Progress estimates that more than 13,000 beneficiaries of the temporary protected status from El Salvador, Honduras, and Haiti <coughs> reside in North Carolina and that they and their children are integral participants in the social and economic lives of North Carolina. And whereas the city of Durham has long shown support for its immigrant communities, including many immigrants from Central America. And whereas these families are an integral part of the community who should be welcomed and supported, and we should protect vulnerable persons who seek safety in our community. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the city of Durham supports the temporary protected status program and urges the Department of Homeland Security to renew the program for Nicaragua and Haiti, to continue the program for eligible beneficiaries, and to support refugees and other immigrants fleeing war, violence, and natural disasters in their home countries. This is the 18th day of December, 2017. Thank you very much, Mayor Pro Tem. We have two people who have signed up to speak, and I'm going to ask them to come forward now. The first is Eleazar Posada. And the second is Jose Fidel Campos Sorto. And if you all could both come over here to this um, podium. And uh, you have three minutes. Mr. Posada, if you could state your name and address, please. Good evening. I'm Eliezer Posada. I live in um, 1325 Juniper Street, um, just down the road. So I am the community engagement advocacy manager for Centro Hispano, a nonprofit that most of us know very well. Um, and over the last couple of months, we've been working with different uh, city councils and, and uh, representatives to get this type of resolution passed, not just here in Durham, but in Chapel Hill and Carborough, and now moving into Wake County and Guilford and just trying to get the word out to uh, pass these kinds of resolutions. Um, to many, these are just a symbolic resolution, and let's be real, it is, right? But for our community, for, for the people who are affected by TPS and who are may, maybe losing their status and losing their homes, it lets them know that they're welcome. It lets them know that uh, Durham is a place where they can live, they can be free, and they can be safe. Um, as the resolution states, there's over 13,000 TPS holders here in North Carolina alone with over 11,000 children who are either US born or residents. Uh, Together, they make over $560 million to North Carolina's G GDP. Um, and I want to thank you all as part, uh, from El Centro Hispano and from my personal, uh, myself, that uh, you guys are taking these steps to uh, acknowledge that our community is welcome in Durham and doing these symbolic measures that really go a long way to make sure that our community shows up to uh, the council and, and starts learning not just about their own city, but about their elected officials and what you guys can do for not just the Latinx community, but the entire community in Durham. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Posada. And now we will hear from Jose Fidel Campos Sorto. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. My name is Fidel Campos Sorto. I live here in the uh, 15 Forest Oaks. Drive, Durham, and 
I'm the vice president of the uh, um, North Carolina Salvadorian Association here. And uh, I would like to, to thank all of you, the city council, uh, because of the resolution to support our, uh, our partners uh, from all the 13 countries, the, the people uh, are under this PPS program. So uh, on behalf of National TPS Alliance and the North Carolina Salvadorian Association, we thank all of you uh, for this support uh, for our, our people in, in around the, the world, the countries, especially in, for the Central American countries. Yeah, that's, that's uh, we are here for, to thank all of you, and in the near uh, future, we would like to know specifically uh, in, in which uh, actions uh, we feel better, uh, that's support, because this is a declaration, but that support us, uh, in order to feel more comfortable. And we are, uh, we know uh, you uh, accept us as uh, members in the community. And we are um, happy about that support. That's enormous support, really. Thank, Thank you. Very thanks. Thank you. Thank you for you. being here. And Thank you to thank you to all the other folks who were here tonight. And let me just say that I'm sorry you had to stay so long before we're about to have this vote, but we very much appreciate your being here and staying here for this very important action. Any council members have any other comments before we take this matter up? Mr. Mayor, I do. Mm -hmm. I want to thank the Mayor Pro Tem for, for reading the resolution. Uh, I just want to go on record as, uh, saying that I think the resolution represents the highest standards and values of Durham and I'm proud to support its adoption. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. I would just like to echo that sentiment and, and uh, thank, thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Madam Mayor Pro Tem, would you like to make a motion on this? I would love to move that we adopt this resolution. Second. It's been moved and second that we adopt this resolution. The, uh, Madam Clerk, would you please open the vote? Close the vote. It passes six to zero. Thank you all very much. Thank you for being here. And we are, we are with you. And we very much hope that you are able to prevail. And we're glad to add our support to your efforts. Thank you so much. Now we'll move back to item two. Again, I apologize, uh, council members. I simply overlooked it. Uh, this is on the general business item. Uh, and Pull it up here. This is the uh, city council vacancy to adopt the timeline to fill a city council vacancy. And I'm going to ask our city attorney, Patrick Baker, if he has any comments at this time. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Um, <coughs> in my recommendation, uh, original recommendation, I, I recommended that you take uh, or consider seven different actions. Um, one of which was to direct the city clerk to publish a notice of vacancy to determine the form of the initial application and determine the deadline by which the initial application should be completed and returned to the city clerk. Um, as you'll recall, you took those actions uh, during your work session, suspended and voted on that, and, uh, and the applications have, have gone out. Um, council met, uh, although the full council ended up meeting, it was a, actually a council uh, procedure subcommittee meeting uh, to take up the other uh, matters, uh, one of which was to develop and adopt criteria to evaluate the initial applications, develop and adopt a questionnaire to be used to further evaluate candidates, um, to develop and adopt a candidate interview procedures, and to uh, to propose a, a final timeline to complete this process. Um, uh, all of which you took up in your um, uh, in your procedures subcommittee uh, hearing, 
and there are three attachments um, that, that specifically came out of that uh, subcommittee meeting, which was the questionnaire, the interview, the candidate interview procedures, and the uh, the final timeline, uh, which uh, all three of those would be in front of you tonight to consider adopting. So would you restate again the three things we need to adopt, Patrick? Uh, you would be adopting the timeline, um, you would be adopting the candidate questionnaire, and you would adopt the applicant interview rules and procedures. And there was a fourth one, the, the adopting the criteria to evaluate the initial applications. I was never quite sure if you specified something other than meeting the, uh, the, um, uh, the requirements of the initial uh, application, which I think was where you, you landed, was that it would be vetted by um, uh, the clerk mm -hmm. that the initial, uh, the minimum qualifications are met. Thank you very much. One clarification. Yes, there. please. Mm -hmm. um, I just noticed the attachment includes the it's revi number seven revised questions for the candidate questionnaire. It circulated uh, with the city clerk, um, kind of a, a, a version that included instructions and a place for candidate name. Um, and so I wanted to bring that up here before we adopt mm -hmm. this memo. Can I ask, uh, just to clarify, Council Member Alston, mm -hmm. was it, can you describe the differences, or are they are they a few differences, or are there a bunch of differences? They're very very nominal differences. Okay. Um, essentially, and I can find it. Essentially, it just had a heading, you know, it said candidate questionnaire, oh, okay. city of Durham vac at large vacancy, okay, a space for candidate name, and instructions on completing the questionnaire. No substantive changes to the questionnaire. Right. Okay. So, Patrick, we could adopt this yes. that, that that as well. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, other comments and questions at this point by council members? Any comments or, or questions at this point? Um, we have discussed at the uh, work session the uh, way in which we might want to uh, vote on the final applicants. Uh, Mayor, I believe that was at the procedures committee. I'm sorry, you're right, it was at the procedures committee. Is this a good time to talk about that, council members and Patrick, or should we uh, hold that to with the work session? Do you, do you, can you advise us, Patrick? Um, that, that, I would really leave that up to you. It, it wasn't included in the materials here, mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if you want to take that up separately or you could. Yeah. Uh, council members, do you have any thoughts on that? Mr. Mayor, if I might. Mm -hmm. It doesn't appear to me that um, either the city charter or our council procedures manual dictates any particular method of selection um, and for that reason, uh, I think we don't necessarily need to decide that tonight. I think if we want to have a conversation about the, the costs and benefits of any particular selection pr uh, method, that conversations might be better uh, situated for a work session than a, than a meeting of this kind. So that would be my recommendation is that we just take it up on Thursday and um, figure out the right kind of procedural setting to do that. We can, Figure that okay. out. Good advice. Thank you. Does that sound right to you, Patrick? Yes. Great. Thank you very much. All right, council members. Uh, we are being asked to approve the timeline, the questionnaire, and the interview rules and procedures. Is there any more discussion? If not, I'll entertain a motion. Ms. Can I just ask a clarifying question of the city attorney? Mm -hmm. I, uh, can we move all of these things on one motion? Is that appropriate? Yes. Great. In that case, I'll, I, will, I will do that. Thank you very much. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt the timeline, the questionnaire, and the interview rules and procedures. Any more discussion? If not, Madam Clerk, for the last time in 33 years, could you please hmm. open the vote? No. I'll vote no. Close the vote. No, I don't like that. It passes 6 to 0. Thank you very much. Mr. Mayor. Yes, John. Uh, Madam Clerk, do you, did you, were you able to find out the information about folks who may have, uh, may have submitted applications today? Um, it was two additional people. Okay. Just two. Thank you. Thank you very much. I believe we are now at the end of our business, and I will declare this meeting adjourned at 9.47 p.m. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, sir. Good job. Thank you, Ann.